This is Jocko Podcast number 396 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. According to the Marine Corps, quote, physical fitness includes a set of characteristics that people have or can achieve relating to their ability to perform physical activity. Our service members must demonstrate the ability to physically accomplish all aspects of the mission while remaining healthy and meet the criteria for deployment, retention, and continued military service. Many components of physical fitness are shared across the services. The common thread among them is that service members and their families benefit from a holistic approach to physical fitness. A well-rounded physical fitness program should include varied cardio training, balanced strength training that includes core strengthening exercises, flexibility, speed, and agility training, appropriate amounts of sleep and recovery, and effective mind-body programs such as yoga, martial arts, and meditation. Physical fitness is a fundamental element of one's physical and mental health, mission performance, and readiness. End quote. And that is what the Marine Corps says about physical fitness. And similar statements to that are made by all the military branches and special operations. These ideas are taken to an extreme in many cases, but these philosophies are not only applicable to the military. The same things can be said for any human being in any walk of life. It is better to be stronger, faster, and healthier. And there are always people out there and companies and movements that try and share this mentality and help people find this path of health and one of those movements, and really one of the most prominent of those movements, is CrossFit, which is a methodology that's made a huge impact on people around the world and continues to help people to get on that path to improve physically and in all those other aspects. And CrossFit right now, currently, is being led by a veteran Marine infantry officer who graduated from the United States Naval Academy, who served in both Iraq and Afghanistan, got his MBA from Stanford, worked at some little tech companies like Google, Facebook, and Pinterest, His name is Don Fall, and it's an honor to have him here with us tonight to share his experiences and his lessons learned along the way. Don, thanks for coming down, man. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. The honor's mine. Yeah, pretty pretty wild little story you've been on. Little wild ride you've been on. Never would have predicted. I from the Marine Corps to Pinterest. I say Marine Corps to cupcakes and ponytail. So you can't write it. Uh, we're going to have to we might have to dive into Pinterest a little bit cuz that's the one social media thing that I I don't really get too well. Not made for people like you. Let's okay. leave it at that. <laughs> okay. And then what bothers me is I'll search an image and I'll want to, and one of their images will pop up, and they I won't be able to get it for some reason. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's telling me to sign in with something. <laughs> Once uh, again, by design. <laughs> yeah, they're trying to keep. They know me you're at bay. coming. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll get there. Uh, in the meantime, let's let's. I always like to start at the beginning. Let's how you got to where you are. So. You were born in what, in New Jersey? Is that yeah, right? little town called Allendale, uh, right outside New York City, about 15 miles, uh, Bergen County, New Jersey. Is it, so New Jersey, is it far enough to be in the woods or is it city? Suburb, like full okay. on suburb, full-on suburb in New York City. Yep. Because there's places like the Pine Barrens that are full on woods in New Jersey, people don't think of. Oh yeah, I mean, New Jersey, Garden State, most people scoff at that, but there are big parts of the state that are beautiful. Yeah, and then there's the Jersey Shore, of That's course, right. as well. So there's a lot of variety in Jersey, but you're in a straight up suburb. Straight up suburb of New York City. And what'd your parents do? Uh, so my dad was a environmental engineer back in the 80s, like early days. So when the EPA was first established, started cracking down on companies, my dad worked for a company that would take processed waste, uh, toxic waste and process it. My mom was a nurse, um, so she uh, you know, went to nursing school, was a nurse until uh, she got pregnant with me. And did you have any veterans in your family? I had an uncle who had been drafted in Vietnam, but was never talked about. Uh, I had both my grandfather served for a short period of time during World War II, but also, it was never a topic of conversation. So I grew up in in a family and in a town where 
the military service was not a thing. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I, when I was talking to my parents about this the other day, when I decided to go to the Naval Academy, I remember friends of mine asking me like, hey, what happened? <laughs> I thought your parents could afford college. <laughs> my mom was telling me several of my teachers called her and said, how could you let your son do this? Dang. Yeah, which is really unfortunate. That's why. So before you before you got to the academy, you're growing up. What are you doing in high school? Are you playing sports? You playing all sports? What are you doing? I was. I was super into sports as a kid. Unfortunately, not really great at any of them. Uh, played football, basketball, baseball, soccer. Uh, really wanted to be an athlete, and uh, but was never great. I knew I had no shot of playing at the next level. So I I graduated. It's funny, Castro, Dave Castro, and I have a really similar story. I, gr I graduated high school with a chip on my shoulder. Because I was never as good an athlete as I wanted to be. Did you train hard? I did. Uh, I would say I was, I was somewhat disciplined, but I didn't re really learn true discipline until I went to the Naval Academy. And what about just the training programs back then? I mean, there wasn't like didn't exist. Kids now, kids now, they're going to like special camps so they can work on their freaking forehand for tennis. They're doing their three week camp for <laughs> forehand in tennis. They're doing a three week camp for single leg takedowns. Like they're getting real specific with these kids. Oh, now. and they've got they've got multiple coaches on the side who are training them in strength and conditioning, who are doing mental training. No, that was that was <laughs> not the thing for me. Uh obviously. Uh no I you know I uh you know played high school sports and you know our our football coach was our, you know, gym teacher. That was the standard thing. And, you know, that's where I learned to do the bench press and bicep curls, which was the extent of my strength and conditioning training for the next 15 years. Hell yeah. um, so I didn't really learn any of this until I got further down the road. What were your grades like? I had good grades. I was, uh, I, I had pretty decent grades. Were you, uh, what, what else were you into? What about music? What music were you listening to? I was a disaster, much to my parents' degree. And I play, oh, l listen to, well, I was, gosh, going way back. So I was a huge Bruce Springsteen. I mean, oh, being yeah. from New Jersey, obviously. Do they issue the, those albums? I wish. I wish. I wish. Or something. <laughs> I, the tattoos when you turn, you know, 13. Um, big John Mellencamp fan, Bob Seger, uh, and then the full 80s craze. So I was, a, you know, a child of the 80s and still an, an adult of the 80s. It's when I when I train now in the mornings, I, I beg the coaches to put the 80s mix on. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else hates it. And... So, so at some point though, you figured out you you saw the naval cab. How'd you see the naval cab? Yeah, I got exposed to it. Actually, there was a weekend visit when I was a junior in high school, and I was thinking a little bit. You know, my parents definitely drummed into me the importance of service. So I, you know, I volunteered with the ambulance corps as, a, as an EMT when I was in high school, and my, you know, did Boy Scouts for a short stint. So my parents were really big on giving back. You know, we knew growing up that we were very fortunate. And so my parents, did, you know, certainly emphasized service. And so I went and checked out the Naval Academy. I thought something in the military might be interesting. Uh, went down for a weekend. Had absolutely zero exposure to the military before this. No understanding of what I was getting myself into. But I remember going down for the weekend and just being struck by how fundamentally different it was from every other college experience. So the other visits that I did, and it totally clicked to me. So I came back from that and said, this is my thing. This feels really hard. I have no idea if I'll want to do this for the rest of my life. I'm 17. I don't know anything. But even if, you know, I do my five years after graduation and get out, I will have had exposure to a, a bunch of life experiences that'll be good for me. Did you understand the difference between the Navy and the Marine Corps? No, not at all. And when I went to, <laughs> I really did my homework. That's so crazy. I mean, it's not like it was a big decision. I was just committing a decade of my life. Um, yeah, so I showed up and I thought, you know, if you had asked me on day one, I would have said I wanted to be a backseat pilot. I didn't have the eyes to be a pilot. So I thought, oh, maybe I'll be a Naval flight officer backseater. Um, you know, and then got to the Naval Academy and got exposed to, you know, they expose you to each of the different uh, parts of the Navy and the Marine Corps. And, you know, once I experienced the Marine Corps, it clicked. How was the, the check-in plebe summer and all that stuff? Was oh. it a shock to the system? Oh. Did, did you have, uh, f in the first 48 hours, did you think, what did, why did I do this? Oh, within an hour. <laughs> I, so I, I, I remember first day, they call it induction day, and they, you know, they structure it, right? It's a shock to the system, just like the first day of any boot camp or basic training. But, you know, they shave your head. Uh, put you in line, take all of your possessions away, right? The standard stuff. And then they start. I remember we had a session where we could say goodbye to our parents. And then you walk back into, there's one big dorm that everybody lives in, 4,000 people in one dorm. And up until this point, the pressure was like a six and a half. And then we walk in the door to go back to the dorm and then it's a full 12. <laughs> and I remember just, if I had any hair, it would have been blown back at that point. And 
you know, by the end of that first day, I I was really you know given a second thoughts. I uh, I, I was in complete uh, you know paralyzed retreat mode. You know they structure it. It's very obvious now where you you can't succeed, right? Like yeah. you you deliberately fail in everything, making your bed, your uniform, etc. I had never been in that type of environment before. I was used to things coming relatively easy to me, and I just could not deal with it. And then I remember on my my second day, it clicked. I was like, dumbass, you're not supposed to succeed. You just got to make it through. You just got to keep your shit together. And that at that point, it got a little bit easier for me. Uh-huh. So once you get into, so plebe summer, you go through, how long is, how long are they messing with you in plebe summer? Is that like six weeks or is it the whole summer? It, it, it's the whole summer. And mm-hmm. actually you're, you know, they mess with you for the full first year. So it's most intense oh, for the, for, for the summer. And then the rest of the uh, class, the brigade comes back. And you get treated like shit through the end of, through May of your uh, first year. <laughs> and are, are you doing sports? Because you have to do sports, right? So you do. You have to do some sort of activity. So, you know, if you're not a varsity athlete, they make you go out and do something else. Again, I had no shot of being a varsity athlete there. And I had an uncle, actually, who was uh, a rower, total stud. And, you know, I really admired him. So I went, Navy's got a good crew team. So I went out there for like a couple of days. I'm like, I'll go give a rowing a shot. I give that about three days. And I was like, this sucks a lot. Um, uh, I have a lot of admiration for rowers because you gotta you gotta love suffering in that sport. Um, it just didn't click with me. The culture didn't click with me. And then I had an upper class. This was fall of my first year. He came into my room. He was a junior, and he said, "Hey, do you play sports in high school?" And I said, "Yeah, yes, sir." And he said, "You played a sport here?" I said, "No." He said, "You're playing rugby. Show up tomorrow." And that was it, there was no choice. And so I was like, geez, you know, I had never thought of it before. I didn't know a single thing about it. Hadn't watched a game in my life, showed up, and that was my thing. I played for four years, uh, you know, thank God for that moment. Are, are they playing a, against other colleges? Is it like a D1, D2, D3 type thing? They have the whole nine yards? It is, It back then it was uh, largely a club sport. So every school but Cal Berkeley was club sport, but we played, you know, mid-Atlantic regions. So we'd play Georgetown, Loyola, Catholic, et cetera, and then they'd have a whole national finals kind of playoff system as well. And the Berkeley Bears just got to be league champs because they were the only ones. Is such that what bullshit. They did? It was such bullshit. <laughs> and their their coach, I mean, they won the national championship for something like 18 years in a row. <laughs> their head coach at Cal was also the U.S. national team head coach. So oh, they just yeah. had the deck stacked. But they were they were really, really good. Shaq. Uh, so what did you end up studying? So I studied systems engineering, um, which is kind of a control weapon systems thing. Was this something that interested you? <laughs> You're like, why the fuck would you do that? Um, yeah, I was a, uh, I was a more of a math and science guy. Uh-huh. Like, didn't didn't like uh, you know the language arts as much. The the math and engineering stuff resonated. My dad was an engineer, and so for me as a kid, that was something that I'd always, I had always aspired to. It just made sense. It made sense, and I enjoyed it actually. And then, at what point did you hear about the Marine Corps? So after my, after plebe year, um, every summer you basically get sent out to get exposure to a different part of, of the fleet of the Naval service. So first summer, um, I think it was first after the first summer did a little bit with the Navy and then did a month down in Quantico with the Marines. Uh, and after a week there totally resonated, you know, as you know, every service has a slightly different culture and the culture in the Marine Corps just really resonated with me. How hard is it to get a Marine Corps slot from the Naval Academy? So it's it's varied a ton over the years. Um, I, I think I can't remember if all the slots went out. There was a period of time during which they had to force people to go Marine Corps, so there'd be slots left over. And then I think after post nine eleven, I can't remember my year whether all the slots went out or not. But post nine eleven, they were really sought after. So it was a really competitive thing. I think it's somewhere between seventeen to twenty percent of Naval Academy grads going to the Marines. And w- when you're at the Naval Academy, looking back now, w- what are you learning from a leadership perspective there? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I think first and foremost, the biggest thing I learned really early on was how to think about others and not myself. You know, I grew up as a kid, you, you know, going to school, even playing sports to some degree. The first orientation is like, you know, thinking about myself. Am I in the, in the right spot? Are my grades good, et cetera? And, you know, that first summer you learn, you know, it doesn't matter if your room looks good, if your buddy's room doesn't look good. Like, and, and that was such a foreign concept to me when they asked me, why is so-and-so jacked up? <laughs> Ask him, why are you talking to me? 
that mindset shift was massive for me. So like really learning what it means to be a great follower in service of understanding how to be a great leader was formative for me there. Yeah, at some point I'm gonna have one of my roommates from Buds on this podcast and he's gonna tell the story about we had a room inspection and a you know bed inspection and a locker inspection and a knife inspection. So our knives, you know, we had to be sharp and rust free and all this stuff. And I of course was super militant about everything and doing everything. And we'd sp- I'd spend all weekend just sharpening my knife and polishing my boots and all this stuff. And so the instructor comes in and picks up my knife and they would shave their arm with your knife, you mm-hmm. know. And if if it could shave their arm, it's a pass. And so he takes my knife and shaves his arms. He's like, you know, basically good job. And then he grabs my buddy's knife and it's just dull as hell. And so, and I've, I'm thinking like, I'm, you know, pretty much awesome, right? <laughs> and the instructor's like, yeah. I was, he's like, what's up with you, buddy fucker? You couldn't even, <laughs> couldn't even help your friend. And he takes my knife. We had the bunk beds with the, there's like a metal rod across the bottom and he takes my knife and just like straight into this <laughs> rod like, like like 10 times there's just big giant like c-shaped divots on the whole knife <laughs> and then i had to go hit the surf so yeah you learn pretty quickly that just taking care of yourself is is, is not going to work out too well yep. and then on the summer cruises so once you decided you're going to the marine corps did you go to do something with the marines every summer uh, I did, let's see, yes. So, you know, following summer then, so after your sophomore year, um, and I, I'm probably screwing up years here. I think I did every summer something with the Marines. I did that that initial session, and then I went back for an intense a month where you did a month in Quantico, and then I did another month in the fleet. So you would do a couple of weeks. I did a couple of weeks with a, a ground unit and then a couple of weeks with the aviation squadron. That was after my, my junior year. Uh, to then set up uh, graduation. Did the dream of being a pilot or a backseater just die some at it, some point? Yeah, it did. It Once did. I, I I didn't have any interest. You know, two reasons. I didn't have interest in um, the in being a backseater. Mm-hmm. For me, I you know it, it was for me front seat or nothing. And and actually, just you know being an infantry marine, infantry leader really resonated with me. How bad was your vision? Real bad. Did you get LASIKs eventually? I, I actually got PRK when I was in the Navy. Okay. Uh, so it was like 2,400, something like that in my left eye. Eesh. Real bad. Did yeah. you, got, you got that while you were at the Naval Academy? I got that actually on active duty oh, right okay. at Balboa. Check. Yep. So you decide to go Marine Corps and you get selected. And then once you get selected, you graduate. You graduated, by the way, I got to make a mention. You know, you graduated with a bunch of people. We have a bunch of uh, mutual friends because... We're, we're actually in the same officer year group. So like all the Naval Academy guys that graduated in 1998, I was in the same year group because that's when I got commissioned was in 1998, including a bunch of mutual friends that we have and then Leif, uh, Leif Babin. Yep. He was also part of that year group. Um, so you graduate and then it's basic school. That's right, yep. So down to Quantico. Uh, I spent almost just under a year in Quantico. So. All Marine officers go through this basic school. So, you know, the philosophy of a Marine or rifleman where it doesn't matter what you do, we're gonna, you're going to go learn how to be an infantry Marine. Do you know you're going to be an infantry officer when you go to the basic school? You do not. So okay, you know so you you're either ground or air contract. And then while you're at the basic school, about two thirds of the way through, they stack rank the class. You put in a bunch of lists and then you get assigned your MOS. Yeah. And they do that by what? What do they call that system where it's Quality by spread. Quality spread. Very controversial. Yeah. So they cut it in thirds. They start from one, you know, up to the the top of the first third yeah. yeah to me whenever people want to ask me about the marine corps and they want to get some details about why the marine corps is squared away i will talk i will talk to them about quality spread because there's nothing that you could do as an organization that could more clearly show that what is important to the marine corps is the entire marine corps than quality spread mm-hmm. so quality spread echo charles what they do is they got 100 people in the class they cut it up into thirds, and the first person in the first group gets the first pick. The first person in the second group gets the second pick. The first person in the third group. This is this is ranked on order of achievement. So you could be a really really great person and still get one of the last picks. You could be in the top third of the class and get one of the last picks in the class. So <laughs> that's a, but it shows that the Marine Corps puts the Marine Corps above the individual always without question Mm -hmm. when you're at the basic school did was there any challenges that you faced oh for sure yeah what what was hard um i mean you know a new level of i'd say that that was the first time i really got exposure to uh you know being in the field 
and and playing even though you're you're leading peers doing it under quasi adverse conditions hadn't really been exposed to that at the naval academy per se so you know being sleep deprived being out in the cold um trying to motivate a bunch of peers who many of whom could get you know if they're going to go be an admin officer a pilot could give two shits about how the patrol's going <laughs> um so you know keeping folks motivated and focused was a was a real challenge how much time do you spend in the field there in the basic school, so we did did TBS first. Um, I'd say, gosh, probably maybe maybe ten percent of the time. You okay. do a lot of class stuff, and then I did infantry officer course after that. So all the infantry officers then, once you get your MOS, you go to your secondary specialty school. And basic school is like six months, right? Correct. And how long is infantry officer? I think OC is twelve weeks. I think it's three months. Then so you get in there and. What do you? What do you? What are your challenges when when you get to infantry officer school? So infantry officer course takes uh, most of it. I'd say you know much higher percentage of time is in the field. Uh, the bar is much higher in terms of kind of leadership, uh, ratcheting up in terms of the adversity around you know sleep, food deprivation, cold. That's all dialed up, and then you're learning a bunch of you know strategy and tactics mm -hmm. um, employed under pressure again for the first time. So just lots of lots of mistakes on that front. Lots of learnings. Again, surrounded by your peers, all of whom now you've got you know a bunch of infantry officers. So, you know within this cohort of officers, the most probably Type A, uh, and learning how to lead uh, in that group was mm -hmm. was definitely a big big challenge. I had James Webb on the podcast, and he went through his you know he did the same thing: academy, basic school, infantry officer course, nine days leave or something like this, straight to Vietnam, gets to Vietnam. They take him out like in a Jeep. They point to a ridgeline and they say, your platoon's up there on that ridgeline. He walks up to this ridgeline. Uh, there's no officer to relieve because the officer had been wounded or killed. There's some sergeant that's been running the platoon. He takes over the platoon. That night, they get into a significant firefight and he has to call for fire. And I said, did you feel like you were prepared? And he looked at me and said, I was prepared. So that's, that's pretty pretty freaking outstanding that you can take someone that's never been in combat before and the day, the night they arrive in combat, they're doing significant call for fire. And that, that shows you once again, the Marine Corps is a, is a squared away entity without question. No doubt, yeah. TBS was a great school. IOC was outstanding. The curriculum, the cadre, the leadership, the program, in that you know, relatively short time period, they got you about as ready as they could. Do you do a lot of live fire? You do a lot of live fire there. How about force on force training with like either paintball or laser? I we systems? didn't. I don't think we did it back then. That that probably has changed in the mm -hmm. meantime. I, I know it's definitely changed. Yeah. Um, it it changed in the SEAL teams. So mm -hmm. what is this? What year is this? Ninety. <laughs> 90, 99. 99. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's around when we really started going very, very heavy with force on force training in the SEAL teams with simunition, with laser tech. We got a, did you ever use DITS? No. Or sorry, not DITS, what's the old one? Uh, I forget what it's called. But there's an old laser system that the whole military used to use. Yeah, we used that in the fleet a little bit. Yeah, yeah. and it's not good. No, it was terrible. Yeah. yeah, so we got a system that was super high speed mm. and it really allowed us to come as close to simulated combat at, that I can think you could get to. Uh, it was just awesome. And it really helped us in the SEAL teams get better at everything. Mm. You know, It's really easy to assault a target filled with paper targets that mm -hmm. don't move and don't shoot back. Yep. When, when, those, when those targets are moving around, running and flanking you and shooting back, it, it, you have to figure out, you have to, you have to really learn leadership. And that's what we found that that's how we were able to start to improve our leadership was by putting people in pressure situations and having the enemy do what the enemy's gonna do. Yep. So so then where where did you head? So you graduate, obviously. So I graduated, first... I got stationed out at Camp Pendleton. So I got uh, assigned to a unit called First Force, Recon or sorry, First Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion. So it was a mechanized infantry effectively. Um, uh, got assigned to a, a platoon of 30 Marines, four armored vehicles, these light armored vehicles. They look like a Bradley, but have wheels. So big 25 millimeter Bushmaster cannon, pretty badass. Mm -hmm. um, less walking, so got a lot of shit from the straight leg infantry that it was real infantry. Um, yeah, and so showed up at my first command, 
you know, thinking, you know, after four years at the Naval Academy here in Quantico that I knew what I was doing and then cold reality hit me in the face when I got my first platoon. 30 guys in your first platoon and you're going to be on deployment. Are you going on an, on like an ARG deployment or what was the situation? So it would have been a MU and uh, we had some time, between, I think out about a year and a half before, uh, you know, chop into the MU. So I had some time. But I came into it, you know, I came into a platoon, you know, normally as a brand new second lieutenant, you come in, you've got a seasoned staff NCO mm -hmm. who basically unfucks you, mm -hmm. right? And teaches you the job. I came into a unit with 30 uh, Lance Corporals. I had two uh, newly promoted corporals, so super junior NCOs, that was it. How so come? It just happened to be at this point, I think this unit had just come off the muse. so you had a bunch of folks rotating out, they hadn't fully staffed it up yet. And so truly the blind leading the blind. Uh, again, showed up on day one and I was like, holy shit. And first I was very fortunate in that my first commanding officer, our first company commander was prior enlisted, exceptional, and uh, read me the riot act after about two weeks. Uh, and then I, I was very fortunate, got assigned a super seasoned uh, sergeant, mm -hmm. platoon sergeant who was a retread. So he had been a sniper, Marine sniper during the Gulf, first Gulf War. Uh, had gotten out and then came back in oh, and nice. basically taught me the job. And so then you go through a workup? Go through a workup. So I, I spent some time with that unit, um, go through a full workup deployment, uh, and then chop to the MU. You go through, yeah, the, basically the MU uh, workup cycle, about six months. And then I deployed in, uh, we left in August of 2001. Oh, dang. Yep. When, when you're in this position, this is something that gets talked about in leadership all the time. Um, you're in this position, you're obviously not experienced, and yet you're in charge. What are some of the mindsets that you and some of the strategies you used when trying to lead these, you know, the, these Marines? The, you know, I mentioned I had, I was really lucky to have this pretty amazing commanding officer. And he, he after a couple weeks, called me in and asked me the question you never want to get. How do you think it's going? <laughs> Like, oh, shit. Um, and so I, you know, I, I can't even remember what I said to him. But he basically said, you need to stop running around and trying to do your brain's jobs for them. Mm -hmm. Your job's to lead. You need to give them the space to make mistakes. So I'd come out of this, uh, you know, world growing up, world of the Naval Academy, where largely my performance was within my control. Mm -hmm. My grades, even military performance in the Naval Academy, there's a little bit of leadership, but it's largely how you show up. And I show up here wanting everything to be done well because I've got a high bar, a high standard. I don't, I haven't learned yet what it means to lead under those conditions. And so I was micromanaging the shit out of my Marines and we were failing everywhere. And so I had a very tough, very necessary conversation from the CO saying, you need to give your Marines the space to learn and make, make mistakes. And thank God for that lesson. Um, so that was a really big one for me of, of but it was still hard, honestly, like, I was not wired to be comfortable with mistakes and things mm -hmm. not going well. So, you know, being able to, to get a little more comfortable with that, give my Marines a little bit of space, make mistakes was a really big, uh, big learning experience for me. Yeah, I've been explaining that to people quite a bit lately. When you use decentralized command, there's risk involved. Mm -hmm. There's risk involved that, hey, the people that are on the front lines, they might do nine things right and that feels great. And that 10th thing might not be quite what you would have done. It might even be a little bit outside the box. And, and if you decide, okay, well, you see, decentralized command doesn't work. I need, just need to control everything. Then you're going to get back to the point, which is what you just talked about, which is another thing people have a hard time understanding. You can't control everything. Yeah. There's no way you can control 30 Marines in a gunfight. You can't do it. You can barely control them you know, loading up of ship. So if you think you're gonna be able to control everything in a pressure situation, you're not gonna be able to. You have to develop young leaders. You have to have decentralized command. You have to be able to let go. Yep. And it's hard. Yep. And you have to learn how to create clarity for people. And it's not telling them what to do. It's, it's making sure they have the context, making sure they've got the intent. What does success look like? Make sure they have the skills, making sure they're getting feedback when they make mistakes. That was just a completely new skill set for me. Mm -hmm. I had never learned to experience that. It's interesting that in five years through the Naval Academy and then basic school and then infantry officer course, it wasn't quite there yet. For sure. <laughs> I, I'll be honest, it's still not quite there yet. Like, <laughs> remain a work in progress. Jack. <laughs> 
So you're you going to deployment in August 2001? Yep. Now is this a shipboard deployment? Is it this- is. Yeah. So this is a this is a muse. You've got yeah. you know call it three thousand marines get aboard navy ships at this point. So this is yeah this is two thousand one, and so up until this point it was a go see the world. Mm-hmm. It was go go to Australia, go to the you know uh, go to the Far East, uh, get some cool libo to, uh, uh, ports and come back. And obviously that changed. What ship did you deploy on? I was on the USS Peleliu. Oh, I did a cruise with the Peleliu. Nice. Yes, I, I had a good did. weight room. What was it? I wasn't on the Peleliu, unfortunately. Mm. I was on one of the, I think I was on the either the Cleveland, the USS Cleveland or the USS Denver, which did not have that nice of a weight room, mm. but we did the best we could. Echo, you would be happy. We brought a cruise box, and in the cruise box, we had dumbbells. Hell yeah. And we had 120s, 110s, like 100s, 90s, and 80s, and then the ship had the rest. Mm-hmm. But obviously, we didn't carry the cruise box and one. But we we brought the cruise box and then we locked the cruise box. And then if, if the Marines were the cool Marines, we'd give them the combo. What's the cruise box? Like it's a just big locker? like a the big like floor locker. It's like oh, a yeah. it's like a treasure chest. Oh damn! Just made of metal. It's a heaviest. Chest. Yeah. Did you get no. a forklift or something like no, that? No, no, no. We we loaded the Manual. weights individually. Yeah, uh, okay. individual right. breakup. So. You're out there on deployment, August. Were you? Did you make it overseas by September? We 11th? did, yeah. So we, you know, we headed out straight from left from San Diego, um, went to Australia. So went to Australia, and we did a week of training in Darwin. So up in Crocodile Country, up in the north with the Australian Army. We had a week out in the field. Came back first night off. First night off since we had left San Diego. It's almost a month. Mm-hmm. So as you can imagine, Marines are to the winds. <sighs> Uh, I think it was 10 o'clock at night, and I remember being in an Irish pub because there's Irish pub everywhere around the world. There is indeed. And watch 9-11 on TV through this haze of, you know, X number of, of beers that we had had at that point. <laughs> then what happens? So we— They recall I, everybody as quick they as they recall, can? It was, it was this insane trying to recall 3,000 Marines from across Darwin to, to, you know, to leave the next morning at 07. Um, we, I think we got everybody but one or two Marines. They had to meet us— <laughs> They were doing uh, something that shall not be disclosed. And uh, so they, they you know, flew ahead and eventually met us, and we headed out. We actually went to East Timor. Um, so if you remember, there's a little bit of uh, some ethnic cleansing issues yeah. there. And so we were doing some humanitarian stuff. We spent three days there, and then we headed straight for the Arabian Sea at that point. And then what, where were you going? So we, we ended up um, sitting off the coast of Pakistan. And so this is probably now, gosh— uh, late October of 2001, um, starting to do the planning for the invasion. And so we did the Mew, basically. We, we took uh, our hovercraft into a little town, a little Air Force base in southern Pakistan, and then flew from Pakistan into uh, southern Afghanistan, just outside Kandahar. How was, the, how was the attitude of the troops? I'd say, uh, you know, a mix of excited, anxious, Afraid, but not willing to admit it. Um, lots of uh, lots of speculation. I remember one morning, you know, one of the other uh, platoon commanders came in and said, "I heard this morning that Congress declared war on Iran." We're like, "Holy <laughs> Jesus, this just got real." <laughs> Fortunately, that turned out not to be true. Um, and then it was just like, "Get ready." You know, mm-hmm. I think there was the nervous anticipation. What was your What was your tasking? So we uh, originally, so we did a little bit of planning for a while they were looking at, we thought we might have to do an evacuation of the U.S. consulate in Karachi. That didn't go down, um, fortunately. Uh, our tasking was we flew into a, a little airfield called Rhino in the middle of uh, just about probably 60 miles south of Kandahar, I think. We flew into there, and then we drove into Kandahar and secured the Kandahar airfield. And then that became a hub where we started bringing in, uh, you know, other conventional units, humanitarian supplies. And we essentially did security operations in and around Kandahar looking for, you know, uh, Al Qaeda, Taliban. What was the atmospherics on the ground when you get, when you got there? I mean, at this point they were super disorganized. It was, uh, it was uh, surreal. I remember, you know, we drove, we landed in this airfield where there was no one. And then we drove through the desert, didn't see a person. And then as we started getting closer, we were literally just driving through farms and these little mud huts, right, as you see over there. And, you know, we had a translator with us. And you remember talking to them, like, oh, yeah, we haven't seen these in, uh, you know, it's been 20 years since the Russians were here. But so there's an element of, like, we've seen this movie before. Yes. And 
Uh, and then, you know, a lot of, uh, I'd say kind of, you know, uncertainty around what was happening in, um, in and around, uh, Kandahar. So you're, where, where are you based in Kandahar? You we're guys based at the airfield. At the airfield. Yeah. So we secure the airfield. We were basically sitting in fighting holes around the perimeter of the airfield. How are you get, how, what are you eating? Uh, MREs. How long are you in there for? We were there for, I think about three months. Once you had the airfield secured, now are you? They send you out on patrols to go make contact with the Taliban. Or they send you out to make contact with the local villagers. Like what? It was what's a little mission? bit of both. Yeah. So we did a little bit of it was security operations in and around the kind of hub of the airfield. So we would do a mix of just going out and trying to gather information, intelligence. Um, so talking to local farmers and villagers about what was happening. There were a couple, a um, uh, couple interdiction operations um, around one of the major highways that mm-hmm. ran east, trying to trying to catch some of the. Uh, uh, Taliban leadership that was still there. Were you thinking about IEDs, really? We uh, we were not, mm-hmm. but we had a an unfortunately we had a couple Marines step on a, a landmine at the airfield. So there were you know I don't know how many thousands of <laughs> landmines there from who knows when. It, they could have been Soviet era, and unfortunately we had a Marine step on one, and he fortunately survived, but lost part of his lower leg. So that that changed the calculus really quick for folks. But that you were looking at as if it was some old. Could have been some we old didn't Soviet. Know. You didn't really know. Like uh, maybe, maybe the Taliban left it this time, or maybe it's just been here for 25, 30 years. Because mm-hmm. you would drive, you know, if, as you drive around there, you'd have these villagers would mark the the minefields in the area. They put white rocks there for cleared minefields, and red rocks for ones that were not cleared. Um, and so you would just you'd see old ordnance sticking out of these farms. It, you know, it was crazy. Yeah, it's I. I got to kind of see the escalation in Iraq. I didn't fight in Afghanistan, but in Iraq, you know, between my first, between like 2003, 2004, 2006, like the escalation of the threat of the IEDs went went crazy. And in Afghanistan was worse in, in a lot of ways, um, from what I can tell, the, the way it went from sort of like IEDs weren't really a thing. Mm-hmm. And when they happen, you're like, oh, it might have been some old, to, to you know, this is an absolute horror show that we have to be completely paranoid about every every step we take. Yeah, we were lucky. I, I think we were we were there at a time where it was very offensive for us. They were it was still very early, so there wasn't much of an organized counteroffensive at all. So we didn't have to really mm-hmm. think about or deal with those issues. And then, what was your op tempo like? Was it going out every night? Was it going out every other we were, night? We were going out. Uh, I'd say probably once a day um, for kind of limited work in and around the area. But it wasn't crazy. And then it's back MREs. Did you have any like bathrooms, shower facilities, anything like that? We did not. Big negative. Big negative. <laughs> and I will say, I got the, the the privilege there of serving. General Mattis was the task force oh, commander. Right uh, amazing. So he he actually came and he met us in the middle of the desert and rode in with us on our lead. He insisted on being the lead LAV. Driving into Kandahar. What was his job? He was the task. He got appointed Task Force Fifty Eight Commander. Hell yeah! Amazing. So he uh, he came in with us, um, and he was. I mean, as like, what an extraordinary guy. I remember so many moments from. You know, we were our Marines were sleeping in fighting holes. Uh, they had the headquarters element in the terminal. Uh, we had a bunch of Air Force come in. Of course, the headquarters element gets the terminal. Well, but General <laughs> Mattis early on, he said, "Not one of my nobody will sleep on cots." Or Marines sleeping in the dirt, you will sleep in the dirt. Um, Marines will, cold weather gear, n- not a single senior leader will get cold weather gear and wear it until every single junior Marine has it. He personally supervised it. You'd hear stories. I would walk the lines at night, you know, doing the check on my Marines and more, you know, frequently General Mattis would be there at two in the morning sitting next to a Lance Corporal, you know, talking to him about where he's from and, you know, asking him very thoughtful questions around, hey, what's your mission? And, you know, it wasn't just getting to know him. He was inspecting us as well. Um, but, you know, that is a guy that Marines would walk through fire for. Hell yeah. So any significant events that, that left an impact on you as a leader there? I was, I, I remember at the time having this moment of, you know, I think when you're in a, for me at least, I felt like you've got the, the privilege of being in command because it on, on, for a host of reasons, but, um, being in a position where you had the, the ability to think about others first. So you almost didn't have that. I didn't have as much time to think about, I mean, I was scared. Of course I was, but, but being in a position where my first every day was, let me make sure my memory is taken care of. Are they focusing on the right things? That was a really big, um, 
uh, a takeaway for me, as well as, you know, like, as we know, like at the end of the day, my Marines were largely 18 and 19 year old kids. Kids who were, I had a Marine who was six months out of high school. You know, these are kids and seeing how they showed up under the most stressful and adverse of circumstances, man, what a privilege to, to get a chance to witness that. Yeah, the amount of responsibility that some Lance Corporal has sitting out in a fighting position, making decisions that only he is gonna be able to make at that moment in time, that's, it's, it's a freaking a pretty amazing thing to witness. It is, it is. So how do you guys redeploy out of that situation? Do they, do they fly you on helicopters back to the ship or something? We flew on, I think we flew on C-17s back, I can't remember. Uh, oh, we flew to Bahrain. So okay. I think we flew on C-17s uh, out to Bahrain um, and then redeployed from there uh, back out to the ship. And is it what what year? So it's still- So Iraq that's early 2002, off. yeah. Oh yeah. Exactly. So did you feel like we kind of just did it? I know, like my first deployment to Iraq, 2003, got back in 2004, got home in 2004. I felt like, man, I'm lucky I got to do this. Like this war is gonna be over soon and you know, we'll all carry on with the rest of our careers. Did For you sure. have that feeling? For sure. Yeah, and we, we, you know, we were lucky in that I just happened to be on deployment. So when I got back, we were the only Marines in the Marine Corps who had served in combat mm -hmm. for 20 years. Yeah. And so, you know, came back from that. We got relieved by an army unit. And uh, so I, you know, I got, I came back, transitioned to, to my follow on unit and, and, you know, thought that was it. Hey, but you had that combat action ribbon, yo. <laughs> That's right, big time. <laughs> Eating a lot of MREs, earned that combat action ribbon. <laughs> so then, 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 then you went to uh, First Force. Is that right? I did. Yeah. So I, I, when I got back, I transitioned over to First Force, and and then I went into a schools phase. So Force does, you know, you do an infantry tour. Most folks will come out of the infantry and then go to Force, and then they'll do all their schooling. So. You know, we have a, I don't know what they do now, what they call it, but we had a basic reconnaissance course, dive school. The recon course in Coronado, was that That's the right, one? yeah, cool. at the yeah. Amphibase, yeah. So we did a, a three month uh, course there. I uh, went to dive school in Panama City. Wait, how's, the, how's that recon course? It was great, it was great. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Is it uh, indoctrination, like beat down situation, or are they teaching you? They, they're a little bit of both. Uh -huh. it, it's uh, probably 50-50. It's hard, you know, it's definitely some suffering, but it's it's not like buds. It's and not people like aren't buds quitting because the they've already been. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think we had anybody quit. Is it hard to get selected to go to Force Week, or was it because? Yeah, as, as you know, on the officer side, the Marine Corps, you know, back then we only had there's only three force recon company size elements Dang. in the entire Marines. Dang. And each of them probably has three or four platoon commanders. So at any given time, there might be one or two open billets for officers, company rate officers in the Marine Corps. So a lot of it is timing, mm -hmm. you know, you know, does that line up for you? And then they had a mix of, you know, you've got a physical test and then some interviews that you do as well. Did you cross the physical test or what? I did, I did well on part of it. I. Uh, almost did not pass the swim, actually. There was a, uh, a rifle carry, rifle tow, and my form was shit on it. Mm. And I, I made, did like the last 10 meters underwater. Just um, breath hold. Breath hold, We're just gutting it through. <laughs> so, yeah. But you had, obviously you had a good record, and you'd been in combat, and you were like the first people on the ground. I mean. Yeah, I was lucky. I was lucky and I was really fortunate to have, I had a, a battalion XO uh, executive officer at my uh, uh, first unit that was great mentor and advocate for me. So he went out on a limb to write letters of recommendation. He talked to the monitor. He talked to uh, to the company about making sure that I had a spot lined up. Are you thinking about Marine Corps for life at this point? I am probably, I, I, I didn't think I would serve for life, but I was open-minded around when. So going to force, the Marine Corps has this philosophy where they wanna build really well-rounded officers. So, you know, unlike some of the other services, even on, you know, on the force recon side, as an officer, you could not spend your career there. Mm -hmm. You could do a company grade tour for maybe three years if you're lucky, and then maybe you come back and command one of the three units as, a, as an 05 lieutenant colonel. That's it. And so I knew that I, you know, going to that unit was also kind of a strike against you in terms of the career path because oh, yeah. they'd say, actually, if you want to be well-rounded instead of going to force, you should go do a recruiting tour. You should go learn this other side of the Marine Corps. 
I personally didn't have any interest in doing that. And I knew going to force that it probably meant it was a little bit of a step back, but I, I didn't have aspirations of staying in for my career, mm. but I wasn't, you know, I also didn't say, hey, I'm gonna get out after this tour. I was kind of, look, as long as I love what I'm doing, uh, I'll stick around. That was the game plan. Yeah. So you go to the amp, the, the recon school, yep. and then you go to dive school. Yep. Is dive school hard for you since you suck at swimming? It was hard for me. <laughs> I am. Uh, so do you actually suck at swimming? I, I do suck. I am uh, comfortable in the water, but in terms of like stroke and speed, I'm awful. And I got really unlucky actually because um, I show up there and you know they pair you with the swim buddy. And the way they pair you with the swim buddy is they have everybody swim and then they just go by speed, mm -hmm. okay? And I was a decent swimmer, not a really good swimmer. And then so I ended up second in our class in terms of speed. The number one guy was a former uh, competitive swimmer, uh, lifeguard in Hawaii, uh, Ironman triathlete, total <clears throat> stud. <clears throat> not the guy you want as your swim buddy that you're tied to when you're doing these underwater swims. And he dragged my ass all over Panama City. <laughs> it was brutal. So, so but, wait, I said you sucked at swimming and you were number two in the class? Yeah, but I, I didn't say, there weren't that many of us that were great swimmers. We yeah. had one guy that was great. I, I was enough to kind of get by, I could get my way through it. Do you learn closed circuit when you're down there? Yes. Okay, so this is yep. you get your full diving package. You're gonna be a full right. fledged combat swimmer. That's when right. When you get done with that. And then what? Do you go to Airborne after that? Uh, so you sh normally go to Airborne. You go to Airborne, then you go to Free Fall. But I got pulled out at that point of my school's phase to go to Kuwait. So this is now end of 2002. And they say, hey, just kidding on Airborne. Why don't you come back, do a really quick workup with your platoon, and then deploy to Kuwait. I think we deployed in maybe February of 2002. February of 2002. Is that right? No, 2003. February Sorry, 2003. Because now they're getting yeah. us over there. So now we're looking right. at Iraq. That's right. So, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> what did you done with your platoon to before deployment? Did you do a normal we, workup? We did a, a very hasty three-month workup. So I think we went out to NTC at Fort Irwin. Mm -hmm. We did a mini shooting package. Uh, we did a patrol package, and that was it. So it was really hasty. And how's this Force Recon? So you're a platoon commander in Force Recon? I'm a platoon commander, yep. And how so, many guys you got in your platoon? Uh, about 30. Okay, yep. so it's about the same size. And how's this platoon? Uh, amazing. But I, you know, I entered this platoon now as, I think I had two Marines who were younger than me. Everyone else was more experienced, had a bunch of tours under the belt. I was the, the FNG for sure. And um, very intimidated coming into this. I had, now I had a, you know, the combat deployment under my belt, so I had a little bit of uh, experience, but I also hadn't gone through, normally as a new platoon commander, you're going through a full shooting package, a full weapons and tactics package, you're going through all of this. I had a, a compressed piece of mm -hmm. that. So that was, a, that was a hard transition for me, but I was really lucky to have an exceptional um, platoon sergeant and amazing team leaders. So when you get to Kuwait, the the invasion's imminent. It is, and we don't know how long. So we basically show up and say, hey, hang out in Kuwait in this tent city and train, and at some point, you know, we think the invasion's coming. And mm -hmm. I think it was maybe two months, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, if you got there in February, it must've been like two months. Mm -hmm. And so what was your mission tasking when the invasion happened? So we did, um, we put some teams in really early in the first couple of days. I think uh, first day we put a team up near, um, I think north of Alcut, mm -hmm. um, looking at, so these were deep reconnaissance. The Marine Corps Force Recon basically had, you know, kind of dual mission set. They did the green side deep reconnaissance mission, and then there was the direct action piece. We did all deep reconnaissance stuff. Mm -hmm. So early on, it was looking at uh, major highways, keeping an eye on major Iraqi units to get advanced intelligence on things. Um, and then uh, we did a similar mission um, in uh, Al Hala. So we ended up in Al Hala for a while. We spent a little bit of time on the Iranian border, basically staring at sand, doing mm. nothing. Um, so let's say Halah. Yep. So you guys go into Halah, or you're out on the outskirts of Halah? We are right in, we are right next to the, the uh, ruins of Babylon there, like literally sitting right on the river. So are you guys dug in? Are you hiding? Are you like nope. in that kind of mode? We're in a relatively secure area, um, going out and doing um, kind of missions in and around that space. And you're reporting back what you're seeing. Had the push already gone past Halah at this point? It had. It had. 
Yeah. Okay, so you guys were like a stay behind force that was going to check things out and see what the yeah. atmospherics are there. And and you know, I think at that point, looking back, I don't think we necessarily had a really good, clear mission. Mm-hmm. Like we were supposed to be forces supposed to be a meth asset out way out in front, and uh, we ended up after those initial few days of the war. Um, I think with a little bit of a question mission for the next month or so. How was the mentality like? But once the war kicked off. It was, uh, I, you know, I think some excitement, a mm-hmm. um, little bit of candidly frustration. So we got into a couple places like sitting up on the Iranian border, sitting in Al-Hala, where we were twiddling our thumbs and felt feeling like, gosh, we could we could be doing a lot more. We could be adding a lot more value. Um, a lot of frustration from folks uh, in, on the team. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know that you guys did those like kind of straight reconnaissance missions in the in that war i didn't know that until yeah. you just told me and that was just the that was just the initial kind of roll up so you know the the division moved so fast mm-hmm. so it wasn't a long period it was maybe a week maybe um and then we ended up where um you know essentially behind forward lines mm-hmm. doing kind of local operations any any significant thing happened there that not really leadership lessons learned uh well <clears throat> definitely some lessons learned we had you know, during that period, our, uh, so I came into force and I worked for, my boss was the company commander, which it, that bill was in 05, Lieutenant Colonel in the Marines. Uh, I had a great Lieutenant Colonel when I came in, checked in, and then he got replaced. And the guy that we deployed with, our commanding officer there was challenging. I'd say uh, from a leadership perspective, um, very self and career oriented. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of decisions that were transparently about him and his advancement in his career, some decisions that put Marines' lives at risk. And so we had this really, really uh, challenging and fraught scenario where, and all the Marines could see it, mm-hmm. you know, in the, in the general, right, in, the, in, in Force Reconnaissance, we were dealing with more season, more experience. They all see what's happening. And it led to a very, very tense, very challenging environment where you had a lot of Marines uh, get very, very frustrated at the leadership they were seeing with, you know, a few of us sitting in the middle and, and trying to deal with it. So I just wrote down, we know, and that's just a message out there to everybody. If you're in a leadership position and you're doing things that are for yourself, we know, <laughs> we know what you're doing. Everyone sees it. You, no matter how smart you think you are, we know what you're doing. We see right through it. You can't fool us. What did you do to try and buffer this guy from your troops? It was, I look back on it actually, it was, I mean, this is cliched, but true. I think I probably learned more from working for that leader mm. than I did from working for the great leaders. I think there were some things I, I tried to do to protect our Marines. So I, I, I did my best to, when I was in front of them, I didn't express my frustration with him. You know, I supported the mission, I supported the decisions that we were making, even the ones that I disagreed with. So I didn't want them to see me undermining decisions that were being made. We already had enough challenges with confidence in the chain of command. Uh, at the same time, uh, I he definitely influenced my the way I showed up in a way that was not as constructive. Mm-hmm. It became, I got to a point where every day I was like, fuck this guy. Whatever comes out of his mouth, I'm not, it doesn't even matter if I agree with him, I'm gonna fight him on everything. And And you know, we would sit as peers, you know, in our tent at night and just bitch about this guy. Mm -hmm. It did nothing to help us. It was so, you know, we finally got to a moment where I think it it finally hit home for me where I was like, Jesus, I I get to choose how I show up. Mm -hmm. And I'm letting this guy affect the type of leader I am, my mentality, my mindset. And, uh, you know, I look back on that as a one of probably the most profound learnings I've had as a leader. Like you can go through shit circumstances, you always have a choice in, in how you show up. Yeah, I get asked that question probably 10 times a month. You know, I've got this bad person I work for, and my, my answer is always, the answer that people don't wanna hear is like, oh yeah, you have a bad leader, cool, build a good relationship with them. This is the best possible thing you can do. Mm-hmm. It, the best pos- possible thing you can do is try and build a good relationship with them so you have some kind of influence over them because if you don't have a good relationship with them, you have no influence whatsoever. Yeah. So the best thing you can do, try and build a good relationship with them and then you can maybe sway, sway them in one direction or, or another a little bit. But just deciding that, oh, this guy's an asshole and so I'm gonna be an asshole, it, it, you, you're just not gonna be, you're gonna be in a worse spot. 
That's right. Essentially. Yeah. And by the way, that, you know, I, that was, I was relatively young having the benefit now of, you know, a couple of decades, of you know, in your career, this is going to happen to you multiple times. Yeah. Guaranteed oh, military, yeah. civilian business. Yeah. And I remember someone saying to me once, um, you know, the, the goal is being able to look at every scenario and be proud of how you showed up. No matter what the circumstances are, do you yeah. look back and feel good about how you showed up as a leader? Yeah, I always tell people that you can go meet, there's leaders that I worked for that I definitely did not like very much and that they never knew it. <laughs> you know, like I was just professional, okay, sir, yeah. that's what we're doing, yep, sounds good, let me do. Let me see what I can make happen here. That's And again, no one wants to hear that because everyone thinks, well, you know, if someone's taking care of themselves, you should stand up to them. Cool. It sounds cool. It does. It sounds cool. It sounds heroic even. Mm -hmm. But then what happens? You get fired mm -hmm. or you get dealt an even worse hand and you didn't take care of your guys. You have less ability to take care of your troops. You have less influence on the mission. So it, your ego feels good. It's an ego victory. But it's, it's essentially in the, in the big picture, in the strategic picture, it's a, it's a loser. That's right. I was very lucky. So I was a prime enlisted guy mm -hmm. for eight years. So by the time I was an assistant platoon commander, I was 28 years old or 27 years old, which might not seem like that big of a deal, but compared to 22, that's a big deal. Oh. So I, I was lucky in that respect and I was starting to learn these lessons. So I was a, a little bit, a little. I, I always feel like I was just ahead of, just ahead of some of the stupidity I would have pulled off three years prior, two years prior. I was like, totally. I look back, I'm like, oh, I'm so glad. That, I'm glad I was in that position when I was, you know, 22, because I would have been like, you got to be kidding me. This guy's a piece of shit. Well, totally. what? You know, and I just was, like I said, I was just lucky enough to have been a little bit older and be able to pull that off. So, how long were you guys, how long do you guys stay? We in were there Iraq for? through, I think, probably July of 03. So, I think I rotated back in July of 2003. And at that point, you know, so I'd been with the unit for a little over a year at that point and was about, would have gone into, uh, you know, workup cycle. So deploy again with the MU, probably go back overseas, finish Would you have stayed with Force Recon? Yes. Okay. So I would have been able to finish out my tour there. And I decided at that point, um, I'm not working for this guy for another year and a half. Mm -hmm. And I <laughs> spent a lot of cycles since thinking about that decision. And, um, you know, it was... I, for me, that my career in the Marine Corps was about trying to create the opportunity where maybe I could have a shot at being that platoon commander. And, you know, walking away from that was a hard decision, but I felt like it was the right thing for me at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and again, lots of mixed feelings looking back on it. So what's your move when, when you decided to get out of the Marine Corps? So, you know, I had, I decided at that point, hey, I'll, I'll get out. And, you know, initial emotion is excitement. Uh, you know, I, uh, get to think about what's next, not being a Marine. I've been on active duty for 10 years. Don't have to shave every day. I can go more than a week without getting I'm a haircut. I'm going to everybody. <laughs> so could, if I could do that, I would do that. But, uh, and that was followed very quickly by terror of, holy shit, I have to get a job yeah. and I don't even know where to start. And so I enjoyed a little bit of the San Diego summer and then I, I thought, well, maybe I'll just go to grad school. I don't know shit about business. I actually spent some time here in San Diego interview. There's a bunch of uh, military recruitment firms and I met with some of them and nothing that I saw there was interesting. And I went through this crisis of like, oh shit, what did I just do? <laughs> they offer you, it's like they show you the entire menu and you're like, I'm not hungry. <laughs> oh dear God. Uh, and uh, it's a, so I decided to go you know, apply to grad school. So, you know, studied for this test and applied and put my application in. And that would have been, this was summer of 03, so it was to start in the fall of 04. So I basically had a year. What'd you do for a year? Moved to Colorado and ski bummed. <laughs> so, did you grow up skiing in New Jersey? Uh, I did, okay. um, yep. So uh, ski with my parents up in the, in the Northeast and had a Where? buddy of mine. Uh, we would go to Killington, Pico, uh, Jay's Peak. And Just the whole, the whole gig. The whole, you know, she device here, she yeah. device there, you know, the, <laughs> for sure, sharpen, sharpen those edges, freeze your ass off. Um, and so, yeah, I figured, hey, I've got some time. When am I going to have the opportunity like this? I was single uh, and so moved to Colorado with a buddy who I served with and <laughs> we had a great time. How I, long was your hair? Uh, it got pretty, pretty long. Uh, my hair does not look good long. I start getting these like wings on the side. It's pretty bad. So, uh, but, but it was awesome. So Where I, in Colorado? 
Uh, so I got a, I worked at a bar at Keystone, mm-hmm. and I was lucky. My employer was Vail Resorts, so I had a you know with that job I got a season pass to you know four or five resorts there, and got a job bartending, which is hands down the best job in a ski town. You show up for work at 3 p.m., oh. you work late, you make decent money in cash tips, and you can ski every mm-hmm. single day. So I skied 100 something days that year, uh, and then ended up um, starting grad school the following fall. And this is up in Stanford? Correct, yep. S- and and then how's this go down? How's this, is it, you learning stuff, is it cool? So I you know, went through another like similar moment of like, you know, you show up, uh, this was for you know business degree and show up and most of my classmates are coming out of investment banks and consulting firms and I you know know the lingo or, or raising their hands in class they've seen it all before I knew nothing and so like huge crisis of confidence at this point of like once again shit how am I ever going to find a job hmm. um, you know the way you know business school set up is you do your first year and then you apply for an internship in the fall of your first year for that follow on summer and then you come back for your second year before you go work full time and you know so i applied for a bunch of jobs uh, at at stanford they have this system where you companies will come on campus so let's say it's a uh, uh, morgan stanley comes on campus or google comes on campus and they say hey we're going to interview 20 people you submit your resume if you're interested. They pick 10 of them. And then Stanford says, you know, we want to give people who have non-traditional backgrounds a shot. So we're going to let people bid on the other 10 spots. So in my two years there, I can get picked for a single interview. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, kind of reinforcing this shit, this isn't going to work out. But fortunately, That seems weird to me. You know, there's a lot of, I, I'd say... I was in the very early wave of like post 9-11 veterans. Okay. So, you know, today, tons of veterans who have done amazing things in the Valley. But at this point, there were not that many. And a lot of these companies that are up and coming are only a few years old. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I applied to Google in 05 and Google hadn't been around that long. So you're dealing with. We we don't need some freaking Marine here. They're like, we need this tech dude over (laughs) here. Totally. So you've got a recruiter that's well intentioned, has respect for the military, but looks at my resume as like, I don't even, I don't even know how to, what this means. (laughs) Platoon commander. (laughs) We don't need a platoon commander. That's right. (laughs) Pretty sure we're not looking for that. Exactly. So um, I got lucky at Google because I I had submitted my resume. There was a Naval Academy guy who was working there. I reached out to him. He was kind enough to grab some time with me and literally hand walk my resume to a recruiter and help translate it. What was his job at Google? He was working on uh, the team that supported advertisers. So he was managing kind of a sales and operations team that supported advertising clients. And so so this is after your first year at Stanford. So you, you, no one, none of these companies select your resume. Stanford gave some of these companies your resume, like, "Hey, can we throw this? Can we throw this dude <laughs> this a bone? knuckle dragger, <laughs> right?" And and so one of them was Google. So Google actually came through an outside. So I applied to a bunch on campus. Google, I had to work through this veteran. So I reached out to him and said, "Hey, would you mind? Is there anything you can do?" I think I had applied directly, didn't hear anything. This is 2005. Google's growing like crazy and was super disorganized. So. Um, the only way I got my foot in the door there was through this other vet who was nice enough that led to an on-campus interview. Uh, I met with a guy and went through the interview and, and things worked out. And so this was for your summer internship. That's right. Okay. And then how's that summer internship? It was great. I mean, it was, you know, it's funny. I, I had not worked a single day in technology. You know, my last job was besides bartending, I had to experience, you know, tending bar and, and, you know, lugging an M4 around. And so I show up on Google's campus and Google's campus is like, for me, it might as well be a carnival. Like there are pool tables and ping pong Mm -hmm. tables and it's this beautiful, spectacular and incredibly intimidating for me. I remember I did my interview and, you know, they had made me an offer for the internship, which I pretty, you know, was pretty sure it was a mistake. Um, and I go to meet with the guy who I'm going to be working for, my host for the summer. And he's like, look, I, what do you want to work on? And I'm like, I don't even know what to say. And he's like, I got seven projects. Let me just read them off to you and you can choose. 
So he reads through all these projects. I have no idea what he's talking about. Like none of them mean anything to me. And the last one, he's like, hey, we're about to launch this AdSense API. And so we need someone to work on that, you know, go to market strategy for the AdSense API. And I was like, that sounds amazing. I'd love to work on the AdSense API. I did not know what no API stuff was. No, I had to go look it up. <laughs> so I go into that being like, I'm gonna make a complete ass of myself. I know nothing about technology. I can't write a ling- single line of code. My perception is you've got like the smartest people in the Valley working there. And I remember I had this, this amazing uh, professor at Stanford, a um, guy named Irv Grossbeck, who teaches a class on leadership there is exceptional. He built cable vision, huge cable conglomerate. Uh, and he basically gave this advice. He said, look, just simplify things, like be useful and be liked over the summer, mm-hmm. just when it comes down to that. So I showed up and you know, I worked hard and learned over the course of the summer that you know, a lot of the things that I had learned in the Marine Corps, a lot of the things I had learned, like turns out getting shit done, working hard, holding a high bar, being a great teammate, those things pay dividends in this completely different and foreign environment. So left that summer, had a great time, loved it, learned a ton, and left with an opportunity to go back there after my second year. So then it's another year at Stanford. What's your schedule when you're at Stanford Business School? So business school and law school are very different. At law school, you study a lot mm-hmm. and learn stuff. Business school, the first year is is like, everyone comes in as like gunners, ready to do a great job. And then the second year is very social. So, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> and then the class bifurcates into the people that like want to spend their time on, on the academics. And my second year, I spent more time you know, with friends and classmates and we did some volunteer stuff. And so, you know, you had a few hours of class every day, did a lot of training in sports. So you had a lot of former athletes. So we'd, we'd get after it together and then a lot of social stuff as well. Like what, what sports are you doing at this point? So we are playing a ton of pickup basketball. We're doing, uh, we had this big, actually pretty cool. They had this competition between West Coast business schools where it was a mix of charity and sport. Mm -hmm. So you would compete on raising money for Special Olympics. um, And then we would host all these schools at Stanford and it was a weekend of sports competitions. Uh, and so you'd play flag football and basketball and softball and run a 5K and uh, just get after it. We're not in the best of shape, so you have a lot of a lot of injuries after that weekend, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of pulled hamstrings, but uh, it was a good time. Okay, what are you, what are you learning? I'd say mostly at you know at, in business school. You know, I, I tell folks now like you don't come out of business school with the next expertise to do any job in business. What you get out of business school is like broad exposure into frameworks, concepts, ways to think about things. So what is marketing? What is finance? How do you think about it? So if you do a good job, I think you can come out and ask the right questions, but you certainly don't come out with a level of expertise that sets you up Mm. to be really great in any particular role. So for me, I had zero business vernacular, zero coming out. So I learned a lot about that type of stuff. So then you graduate from there, and now it's Google. Now it's Google. Yep. So I go back. And how's that? It was great. So I went back to Google, and I got a chance to work on. So I worked on what was effectively kind of customer support and sales. And this is 2006. Do they throw you in charge of a team? They do. So that was really important to me. So I, when I came out of my first summer, I worked a little bit on uh, in an area called product management. So at Google... I would say if there is an internal hierarchy of influence, product management is probably at the top. Product, mm-hmm. yeah, product management and engineering at Google uh, rule. So they're figuring out what the strategy is, what to build. Uh, and then I spent the other half of my time working on operations or customer support. And on the product management side, um, uh, really interesting. You get to work with the engineering team, a lot more influence. I'd say was perceived within the Valley as a much more attractive career path. Uh, and certainly valued that way internally. Uh, but for me, I got to the end of the summer, had to choose, do I want to go the product management route or the operations route? And most people thought I was n- nuts to even think about it. Like, of course you go product management. Um, and I decided to go operations because in, in operations, you had the chance to lead a team. Mm. And in product management, you didn't. And someone had given me really good advice around that. And thank God, because mm-hmm. I would have been, I'd say, a mediocre at best product manager 
maybe slightly better than average? So product manager means that we're building Google Docs or we've got Google Docs and it needs an upgrade on this and you're gonna kind of oversee that. Am I close? You're figuring out what's the strategy and who's the customer and what their needs. So you're working with the engineering team to help them understand what to build, mm -hmm. uh, exactly. And then what's the job that you took instead? Uh, what I did instead was answering emails from pissed off users of the product, mm -hmm. aggregating the top requests, dealing, you know, it, managing, a you know, managing a team of folks who are working directly with your customers, dealing with the day-to-day -day issues that come up as part of it. So customer support, I always said like for a long time, I always worked on teams that had the biggest like self-esteem issues within these companies. It was the teams that were perceived as like our team, our work isn't as important as these other teams. And so that was a really good learning for me early on. How do I articulate what we do in a way that really resonates with these folks to keep them motivated and excited? And the leadership that you learned in the Marine Corps still works. Still works. I mean, I, I had a little bit of an adjustment phase. Some of the some of the language and vernacular had to change a little bit, but that was, you know, it seems so dumb to say it, but I learned that like, you know what? Human beings are human beings, yeah. right? Leadership, there are so many of the principles that are universal and I learned that there for sure. So then how long are you at that job for? I was there for only a little under two years. So I, I was there for about two years, loved it, learned a ton. Google was a really fun and exciting place to be at that point. And uh, I was looking at another role internally and a friend of mine from grad school called me and said, hey, he was working at Facebook at the time, called me and said, hey, we are uh, building a support team, building an operations team. Um, we're looking to hire someone to build it. Do you wanna come over and interview? And at this point, I'm like, dude, I have less than two years of experience outside the Marine Corps. And he's like, look, you should just come over and interview. So this is 2008. So I went over and interviewed, interviewed with the, you know, the executive team. So, you know, with, with Zuck and a bunch of the other senior leaders at that point, uh, and got hired into this role that I was totally unqualified for. Mm -hmm. It just incredibly lucky that the person who hired me didn't realize how underqualified I was because he was a business development guy, not an operations guy, mm -hmm. you know? And so I, I came into this role and, uh, you know, at the time, it, in retrospect, looks like an obvious shift. At the time, people thought I was nuts to leave Google. Mm -hmm. This is the point when Google's you know grown really fast. So, you're being uh, extremely humble here. Obviously, you know I didn't know what I was doing and all this stuff. But is it that humility you think that is getting you these positions? Because I know the number one quality I tell people to look for when they're hiring people is look for someone that's humble. Because you take someone that's smart enough they're getting in there, if they're humble, they'll figure out what to do and they'll make it happen. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's, you know, instead of just blaming the guy that hired you for not recognizing how dumb you were, <laughs> <laughs> giving yourself a little bit of credit to say, look, you went in there and when they asked you a question you didn't know, you said, you know, I'm not really sure about that, but I'm sure we could get it figured out. For sure, and, and you know, that's absolutely part of it. The other thing I'd say is I think my, um, I think coming from a different domain was ended up being a huge advantage for me. So the thing that I was most worried about was I'm gonna come in and interview for a role where the requirements are 10 to 15 years of experience in consumer technology leading teams. I don't have that. I've worked for 18 months in tech in total. And so the way I compensated for that said, look, I can't manufacture experience, but what I can do is make sure I'm the most well-prepared interview ever. So I would read, I read, everything. I read their 10Ks, even though I didn't understand them. I used every product. I would support uh, submit support requests for all the products. I'd use their competitors. Um, I got to the point where if I was- Wait, you uh, did that for the interview? Oh, yeah. That's squared away right there. See? Everyone. See, I knew there was a little more to this game, right? <laughs> hey. A little bit more than luck. Well, it, it's, you know, it, it would, that's, and that's what I learned in the military. Like, I will yeah. be the most prepared. And yeah. so I got in and I remember my early interviews. I was lucky to get my early interviews out of the way at Stanford. And I was a train wreck. Mm -hmm. Like, thank God none of those are on video. Um, but I got to the point where I, my mentality was, if I get asked a question that I do not have a prepared answer for, I've failed. And so I had a, you know, dozens and dozens of pages. I would write out all the questions and I would think about it. I knew I had the challenge of, look, I can't just recite military experience because people don't get it. I have to help them understand how my experience is relevant in this totally different cultural context. So how do I think about the stories I tell and the way that I tell them that aligns with what they're looking for? So what is the culture here? Okay, great. What's the misperception I've got to overcome? Okay, leadership in the military is tops down hierarchical. 
misperception. Okay, I know that that is a perception this person is likely to have. How do I make sure whether they ask me directly or not that that answer gets into the conversation and dialogue? So I got to the point where I prepared, you know, knowing that I didn't have domain expertise. I walked in just about, and I still do that now. I think I my aspiration when I interviewed for the CrossFit job, I'm going to be without question the most prepared person they talk to. Mm-hmm. You know, this is 20 years in to my career, and and so um, that was something I learned early. What year is this? This is 2008 Facebook. So the economy already crashed at this point. It was uh, just before. So this is February uh, 2008, um, just before the economy crashes. Um, Microsoft had invested at Facebook, invest, just invested in Facebook. Facebook is making a little bit of money, mm-hmm. but is mostly bleeding money. You know, the narrative at this point is everyone told me social media is ne- you're never going to make money. You're an idiot. What? Why do you think you made that decision? I was um, I was still pretty young, and I was uh, the same reason I went into the Marines. The same reason I wanted to go to force. Like it was hard and new. And I didn't know if I could do it, but uh, I, I was really seeking, like risk seeking at that point still. I love the people, I love the culture, and I thought this is gonna be an amazing experience. How many people were at Facebook at the time? Probably about 350, 400, Dang. somewhere in that range. So and it was is... probably maybe somewhere 30, 40 million users, mostly mm-hmm. college in the US still, had just launched internationally, so it's still pretty early. When did Facebook like ramp up completely? Well, it depends how you define that. I, I'd say that over the next- Because I guess 30 million users isn't ramped up enough. <laughs> I mean, now it's now it's peanuts. 30 million users is nothing. You don't get out of bed for it in social media. But uh, I'd say that like within the next year or two, things started to really turn. And we started to build the ad business, started to scale it. We started putting the infrastructure in place internationally where folks were like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. This isn't a novelty. When I joined Facebook, MySpace was bigger. So Dang. MySpace was still winning at that point. So, it, but within a year or two, it became pretty clear that Facebook was on a really strong path. Got it. So you get there, and what's your job while you're there? So I, <laughs> I show up my first week, just left Google, and I'm supposed to come into this job managing this online sales team, which is basically selling medium-sized advertisers, getting them to buy Facebook ads. So I show up on my first day, excited for the new job, a little anxious because I just left Google after I feel like I finally figured things out. And my buddy who had introduced me there introduces me to another guy and he says, hey, Don, meet so-and-so. And And I said, oh, you know, really nice to meet you. What do you do here? And he said, well, I manage a team that supports medium-sized advertisers. And he said, what are you gonna do? And I said, "Uh, I thought I was gonna do that, but there's gotta be a good explanation for this. So I go back to my, the guy who hired me and I said, hey, I'm trying to be diplomatic, it's day two. Um, Hey, I talked to so-and-so and can you help me understand your vision for this role? And he cut, you know, basically says, yeah, yeah, we're basically gonna do, this guy reported to one of his peers, they did not get along. And he said, we're gonna take all the most profitable advertisers from that guy's team and we're gonna manage them. Now keep in mind these two executives, my boss and this other guy's boss, both have a revenue number they're responsible for. Uh, they don't like each other. So <sighs> my second day I realized I have no job. This other guy's like, fuck off basically. Mm-hmm. Three days later, my boss pulls me in and he's like, hey, How's your first week going? I'm like, well, a couple of bumps I didn't anticipate, but he's like, yeah, well, I'm leaving the company. So by day five, I have no job and no boss. And he's like, but uh, look, you're gonna report to so-and-so, it'll be great. So I, I talked to this other guy. He said, in the meantime, if you've got some time, why don't you see if you can walk up and down University Avenue in Palo Alto and see if you can get some of the restaurants to buy Facebook ads. And so, Dang. yeah, I'm door on my first sales. week. Exactly. And I'm like, holy shit. And I just left Google. I have no job. My boss is leaving. And, uh, you know, so that next week I showed up and I, re- I remember there was another inside sales team that they were trying to hire someone for. I'd never done that. And I just came in and said, I'm going to start building this team. And I know I'm not qualified to do it, but when you hire someone, I'll hand it over. And then you can figure out what to do with me at that point. So I brought in my, my business school textbook on how to build a sales team. I'm sure everybody was laughing at me and terrified and started building the team and uh, did that for three or four months. And then a woman who I'd worked for at, at Google came over, became my new boss. She consolidated a bunch of the operations under me and you know uh, things kind of grew from there, but it was a little bit of a shaky first experience. And then how long How long were you at Facebook for? I was there four years. And then what did you grow to? Like what was your senior position and how many people were you in charge of? So 
I when I started there, the team was probably the initial team was probably four or five, um, and then took on some other teams. When I left, team was probably six seven hundred, um, and that's probably about twenty twenty five percent of the company. Um, we had so you grew from five people to, to what did you say six six seven hundred somewhere in that range probably yeah. So we were really fast. So <laughs> insane growth. It's hard to onboard six hundred people. When I was at Google, Google grew with a similar capacity. We had no constraints on hiring. They said basically, if you can get people through the process, you can hire as many people as you want, which is kind of insane to think about. Facebook was a similar rate of growth. So we had to figure out like, how do you preserve quality? How do you put the right process in place? But I got a bunch, you know, I was so lucky. I got a chance to do so many things there. I got to open our office in Dublin. I got to open an office in India. Um, we got to build new functions from scratch, got to deal with governments. Uh, again, whole host of things I had not done before. And Facebook was really cool at that point because the environment was just, look, we're gonna give you the space. If you demonstrate you can get stuff done, you can earn as much scope as you can take on. It was all about impact. It was it was very merit, meritocratic in how things were structured. And that was really, really energizing for me. And they went from 30 million users when you started. What were they in, it up to in four years later? I don't know the exact number. Just some number. exponential crazy yeah, number. It, hundreds of millions. So what year is it when you leave? So I left in 2012. And then what What brought about that decision? So I'd been there for four years, um, loved it. So I went, you know, went from a job where it was, you know, small team, very hands-on, a lot of early building to, um, you know, by 2012 had built out. We had an amazing team, senior leaders. Um, a lot more of my job became interfacing with other parts of the organization. And I felt like my personal kind of learning curve had slowed down a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of ready for the next thing. At this point, I knew, I knew what I was better at and I knew what I was not good at. And so for a little bit, they said, ah, why don't you try something in marketing? Did not go well. Uh, reinforced for me, that was not the right path. And so I loved Facebook. I wanted to stick around. There Hold on, you're good at building sales teams, but you're not good at marketing? Yeah, different Expand skill set. Expand on that. So, so on the marketing side, I, say, I think that the the skill set around the storytelling, oh, how like to tell the creative story, stuff, the, the creative reason side. that you were an engineer in college and not an English major. Exactly Same right. Thing. Exactly right. And on the sales side, a lot of I, uh, a lot of it was about team and team building and structure and process. Those are the things that I was more comfortable with. Um, so yeah, I, I was, you know, at this point I had talked to my boss and said, Hey, look, I love it here. I'm ready for something new. There wasn't a role that really made sense for me. And then had a friend call me who was at Pinterest and said, Hey, um, you know, it's, this is 2012 Pinterest had gone from hundreds of thousands to, I think North of 10 million users in like four months, insane growth. And the team was about 35, 40 people. And he said, Hey, you know, we're building the team. What do you think? So it similar to moving from Google to Facebook, um, you know, thought to myself, gosh, this is a great opportunity to go to another fast growing company. Uh, this friend of mine and some of the other leaders were some of my favorite people um, from Google and Facebook. So it felt like the team was an amazing fit and it was a role that had the opportunity for some new learning for me. So not only operations, which I had done some of the sales stuff, but managing now a senior marketing leader. So not doing the marketing myself, but hiring a, uh, a marketing leader building out uh, early on our, our human resources and people team. Uh, and so it was a chance for me to, to kind of take that next step and learn a bunch more. Same thing, you roll into the interview, just study hard for it, be ready. And yep. now you had a bunch of experience. Too. I had a bunch of experience and, and actually the founder of Pinterest, uh, I had worked with his wife. Uh, she was my, uh, she partnered with me on the human resources team at Facebook. So I knew her well. She was good people. I knew the founder. Um, and so I had a little bit of a relationship. He knew me a little bit through her um, and through some of the other uh, executives who I had worked with before. You know, um, in these tech companies, I know I've gone up and worked with a bunch of them. And, and you see like what you were talking about earlier. You know, they've got like the pool tables and like the Lego room and like all these <laughs> things. But. And there was a while ago, I guess it was as the work from home stuff and people were kind of talking about that. There was some video that came out of someone that worked at Twitter and they were like lounging around all day. But what I, when I was, when I work with those companies, like they're busting their ass. And the reason they have food there is so they don't ever have to leave. And the reason they have yeah. like a place to lay down is so they can lay down for half an hour and then get back to work. What kind of hours 
are you and your team putting in when you're at Google and Facebook and then Pinterest? Oh yeah, particularly Facebook was an incredibly intense environment. So I was, and it was not a healthy period for me. Uh, so I was, you know, f- five, six days a week, I'd, I'd roll into the office at 6 a.m., would skip the workout, eat like shit, work till, you know, three days a week I was there, probably past midnight, back in at 6 a.m. the next day. You've got people there till 2, 3 a.m. grinding. That was pretty common. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you were at home, you were working. Are so, you making a shit ton of money at this point? Uh, not, not, you know, at this point you have, you know, the promise there was was the equity, Mm -hmm. you know, so what the company would be worth. And, you know, that was there, I'd say, but what was driving people was, was the excitement and the impact and the culture. And And early on, it was really- we can do this. We can do this. this. Yeah. We're gonna win this thing. Yeah, it was, it was exciting. And, uh, and so that was that, that culture of people working hard. And you're right. Like, I think the culturally, the inception of a lot of those things was in service of how do we enable people to, 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 to work their highest level of productivity. <laughs> 18 line, hours a day. <laughs> 18 hours a day. And I, I think at a certain point, companies get big enough where they still have all those uh, amenities, but they don't have that you know same drive anymore. And then you can see where it starts to become like, oh, you're in the Lego room again? <laughs> 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 like you've been in the Lego room for two and a half hours? What, what's going on? And, and exactly, and I think at some point, you know, I think early on, we understood the intent behind them. Everyone did. Like, this isn't so you can fuck mm-hmm. off for three hours a day. Mm-hmm. This is it. Look, if you need to create some space, if you need to work it off because you're grinding, great. We're going to make that available. But the expectation is you're going to be here and get after it. And I think at some point when you lose the why mm-hmm. and the intent behind it and you've never heard it before, you have this really dangerous slippery slope where now the expectation is, wait, I how dare you not serve me three meals a day? Yeah, and yeah. the wine bars, the like multiple like oh this corner over here is Asian food, this one's Italian food, this one's American food, and this is going like twenty four seven. Yeah, it's freaking kind of amazing. It is. You see these things, but then I remember you know like you're going oh, there's a bar here. These people aren't even going to leave. Like they're going to have after work sit around and talk about whatever project they're working on and drink wine. I see what's happening here. Mm. <laughs> exactly, crafty. Yeah, so the the Pinterest thing, which we discussed a little bit in the beginning, which I, I, I'm not a huge, I, I, I don't understand Pinterest that well, mm-hmm. But what was the deal? What's the deal with Pinterest, bro? What brief me on it? So should, the idea, should I be on Pinterest? I think you're probably safe not being on okay. Pinterest. The idea is um, is that it's a virtual pin board, a place to discover and save the things that you're interested in and passionate uh-huh. about. It Pinterest was really interesting on a number of levels. I think it was almost the inverse of a lot of the companies that took off in the valley early on. So if you look at the Facebooks of the world and the Googles, they took off amongst mostly tech dudes mm-hmm. on the coasts. Pinterest resonated with women, you know, Midwest, South, um, who were cultivating and crafting these virtual pin boards, saving things that they loved. And so it was really interesting for us early so on. So it's based, it's a scrapbooking It's a scrapbooking, thing, right? that's exactking right. Yo, it's a virtual scrapbooking and, and, and kind of discovery <laughs> thing. So, if so it's not a surprise that I missed out on this gig. <laughs> that you missed out on this thing. And, and it was really interesting for us over time thinking about like how much do a pu- of a push do we make in, in getting men on this? Or do we just double down because it's working so extraordinarily well for women? So wh- wh- where did that go? What was your job there? So I was, um, my title was head of operations, which was basically kind of the biz- managing the business teams. So it was when I first started, you know. Wait, was this the COO or what? Kind of, it wasn't that in title, mm-hmm. but it was a similar scope mm-hmm. in terms of role. So and how many people were there when you show up? Uh, about 35, 35 to 40 total in the company. Um, I inherited a team of, I think four people and were you getting offers for like knucklehead.com as well? Like how did you select Google, then you selected Facebook, then you selected Pinterest, like how come you didn't get a job at freaking <laughs> we're about to fail dot com? Yeah, pets, <laughs> pets. <laughs> com. yeah. Um, you know, honestly, a lot of it was, luck, you know, probably luck and then some, I think coming out of Google, I was exposed, being in an environment where you start to soak in what matters mm-hmm. and you start to, absorb some of the signal around things. That yeah, I was gonna say, it sounds like both both Facebook and Pinterest had like a trajectory that was visible. They had a 100%. visible trajectory that you saw and you're like, yo. 
I, and I was un, like, again, really lucky. Like Google, the other thing too is, is, you know, looking back on this, really fortunate to get the job at Google. Coming out of Google, Google was one of the only places that had the type of scale in the valley that these other companies were looking to replicate. So if you're at Facebook and you're like, okay, we need to build a team that can support hundreds of millions of people all around the world uh, and build an operations team that mm -hmm. combines technology and people, where do we find people who yep. do that? Oh, let's go Google. look at Google. So I, you know, I was lucky to be in that place. And then I got Google and Facebook. And so I get the, <sighs> the luck of like a little bit of the double whammy of it and, and all the lessons that come along with it. And, and you know, that, that was a really interesting place where you're at these companies where the product, you know, in the, in the Valley people will say product market fit. Like you build something that like resonates and then these software things can just take off. Mm -hmm. And I joined right after, you know, probably a couple of years after things had taken off at Google, a year or two after things had taken off at Facebook, the year things had taken off at Pinterest. And that's a really fun time because mm -hmm. you've got the growth and you have to build all of the, you have to build the team and the infrastructure to support it. And so, yeah, I was, I was, you know, I think a lot of it was having those different experiences and then knowing people. And you rolled into basically unconstrained capital into all these companies? For the most part, <laughs> you know, it, it was, yeah, they were growing so fast. Uh, Google was, I think, probably already profitable at that point. And mm -hmm. then Facebook was growing so fast that they could raise money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you had effectively unconstrained capital and resources. Um, Hire whoever you can. Yeah, for a period of Google, that was the thing. If you can get them through the hiring process, you can hire them. So then you're also saying that at this time you're working so much, in some cases, that you're not working out, you're kind of like being lazy, you're eating too many freaking donuts from the cafeteria, the whole nine yards. For sure. Yeah, they had these really dangerous micro kitchens mm -hmm. at uh, Facebook and Google. I don't even know what this is, but we know it sounds good. <laughs> Are you salivating right now? <laughs> And the, but the yogurt covered pretzels were my downfall. Oh. So I, you know, you know, when you get tired, like my, that whole cycle, I wasn't getting enough sleep. I was eating like shit. Uh, and I remember I had a moment where I, uh, I was into triathlon at this point and I had done a race up in the city in San Francisco and posted the picture on Facebook. And one of my buddies, you know, you know, how your buddies in the military mm -hmm. are, they show affection by cutting you down. Yeah. And so I posted this picture and just savage comment from one of my buddies about my gut. <laughs> and I remember reading that and be like, I need to get my shit together. This is embarrassing. And so that was, uh, I got my act together a little bit at that point. And it, and then are you are you married at this point? Are you, what's I'm not, so I met my wife. Um, so I'm dating at this point. So my wife, I met my wife during my internship at Google. So she was, she had uh, gone to school undergrad in the area. She had just started full-time at Google. Uh, we met during my internship uh, and then we dated. Uh, during my time at Google, we both worked there. I moved to Facebook and then she moved over to Facebook two years later. Mm -hmm. So we worked together for a while um, and then we got married in uh, 2010. So that was when I was at Facebook. Okay, so you are married. Now you're at, now you're at Pinterest. Yep. She's still at Facebook? She's still at, at the, Facebook. At that, at that time? Yep. And at what point did you get into CrossFit? So I got into CrossFit while I was at Pinterest. Okay. So so I had, you know, when I got out of the Marines, I had gotten into, when I was on active duty, into triathlon. So played rugby in college, played a little bit after college when I was on active duty, um, got all jacked up, blew out my shoulder, um, got into triathlon, did that for a while, and um, blew out a, a disc in my lower back. So this is, you know, I'm now at Pinterest probably 35, 36, my low back is jacked. Uh, I'm uh, I'm running quite a bit and doing the like you know global gym Equinox three days a week, and you know a couple times a year having like a some sort of back episode where I am laid out on the floor <laughs> immobile bad, and had a buddy of mine um, who I used to run with in the city say hey this is 2014 what do you think about CrossFit and I I had heard about it I had missed the wave on active duty so I didn't see it then. Um, I didn't know a lot about it. And my initial reaction was like, I can't do that with my back. Like, there's no way I can do that. You look and at the website, it was like kettlebell swings and deadlifts. And you're like, 7,000 kettlebell swings. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, you know, it, it, my initial response was, Hey, sounds awesome, but no. And then he was persistent and I said, okay, like, let's go give this a shot. I'll get, I'll give it a try. So he and I signed up, went to a, a, a box in San Francisco, about a mile from uh, Pinterest dropped in and you know I would have said 
walking in that I was in good shape. I was running 50, 60 miles a week, could run pretty fast. I was doing a marathon about every year, Mm -hmm. lifting quite a bit and just got absolutely smoked. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what the workout was? I don't, I wish I had written it down, but Mm -hmm. I do remember for the first probably two to three weeks, I came in last in every workout. Mm -hmm. I remember looking around and like, you know, men, women in their Mm fifties are destroying me. And, yeah. uh, it's, you know, my friend and I had, you know, at that point I was sore as hell. I could only do like two days a week, <laughs> but I was completely hooked. Mm-hmm. Uh, that did it for me. So I did that for, you know, about a little over a year in San Francisco. And then when I left Pinterest to go to my next job, uh, found a, a gym down in Palo Alto. And then what was the next job? So I left, uh, left Pinterest and went to a, a really small early stage company called Athos. So uh, I had worked with a guy at Facebook who, was, who left Facebook to invest. Um, and he had invested in this company called Athos, which made compression apparel with embedded sensors that track muscle activity. So really interesting technology. It captured the electrical signal at the major muscle level. So you could look for an athlete as you trained, which muscles are firing, how hard are they working. When you looked at that kind of data, you could look at overall movement patterns. You could look at overall load on the body. Um, so you could see patterns that were predictive of injury. So for me, it was kind of the intersection of two things I was super interested in, the sports, fitness, human performance, technology. And I had you know been at now three companies that had taken off. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to try something earlier stage. And I remember meeting with this. So I, I, I met with this investor and I'd known him pretty well from Facebook. And I talked to a bunch of other companies uh, and came down to uh, uh, Athos and uh, Airbnb. And um, I, I'd gotten to know the founder at Airbnb, amazing, spent a much time there, incredibly impressed, great company, great culture. The job was very similar, would have been somewhat similar to what I had done. So another mm-hmm. fast growing company doing operations. And I, I met with this investor and he knew me well enough. He's like, yeah, it, it, interesting. Here maybe he's interesting, but you've done a version of that job. You know you can do it. This other job, you've never done this. You don't know if you can do it. I don't think you can do it. And that was it. I walked mm-hmm. out, I was like, fuck you, I'm taking this job. And uh, so for me, it was like doing something early stage that was high risk of failure, totally different environment. Was, was Airbnb that early stage at this time as well? It or was. they were already kind of they were, with the trajectory They were pretty visible? big. Yeah, trajectory. They were well past product market fit, really strong growth, great brands, still yeah. a ton of opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, and you just figured, I don't want to jump on this another incredibly uh, beneficial rocket ship again. <laughs> okay, when you put it that way, it makes you sound like a complete asshole. I wanted, I wanted a new experience, you yeah. know? Like, I was, it was amazing, and that was really hard, because that- How many the, people were at Athos at the time? Probably 50, 50, 55. And, um, you know, two founders, two young founders, um, two guys out of Waterloo in Canada, uh, amazing guys, great culture, and yeah, so I, you know, I started there and, you know, I figured, Hey, this is as close for me in terms of what we're building. This is as close to a 10 as it gets mm-hmm. sports, fitness, human performance, technology. Uh, we were doing some work with DOD, doing some work with pro sport, really, really interesting. And it was an opportunity to kind of learn this new stage. So this is like early in the wearables, very early so this thing. Is and, and exactly the higher capability wearables That's because right. this is tracking so other this parts is of your body. you know when maybe when fitbits at its peak so it was hey you got gen one wearables mm-hmm. which was in my mind was okay there's a ton of demand here but also hey gen one is gen one there's an opportunity to build something that's a lot more sophisticated than just movement and so athos was this we had this really interesting data set like we could see what people's muscles were doing so i thought in that there was a lot of potential um and working in a space that was really fun and then what what happens with Athos? So I, you know, I um, started there as COO, mm-hmm. and um, about ten months in, so founder, uh, amazing. The two founders, incredible. One of them was CEO, both amazing entrepreneurs, amazing human beings. About ten months in, founder and I switch roles. So he moves into a more technology focused role. What he loves, what he's world class at. I moved into the CEO role. First time for me being a CEO. Uh, and then you know six years of battling the startup grind, and so um, you know if there's a mistake to make early stage, we made it. I made it. Um, very humbling, 
I'm like, oh, it turns out it's not as easy as Facebook and Google and Pinterest make it look. Um, doing this shit is really hard. Lots of cultural stuff that was hard. You know, being on the being on the cusp of running out of money mm-hmm. constantly, uh, keeping people motivated, focused. Uh, so it was, it was, you know, I say Athos was for me by far the least successful in terms of the outcome. But, you know, in my, my time in technology, my favorite experience and the, the experience I learned the most from as a leader, without question. Yeah, so you had some survivor's bias going into it, being that you'd just been a part of companies that were just rocket ships, and then you jump into this company, and it was six years you were there. I was there six years. Where is it at right now? Uh, we it basically s- sold part of the team and wound it down. Check. So we didn't make it, yeah. And that's normal. That's just to oh, let everyone that's know. That's 90% plus of startups. Yeah. And I knew that going in. Right. The I was up at MIT and doing some work with them and just the way that whole system works. It's sort of like, um, so the same things happens with book publishers. So book publishers, they buy 100 books. Mm-hmm. They give 100 people 100 grand to write a book. And the, the none of them sell. Well, let me rephrase that. Three of them sell. Yeah. And that's where they make all their money. And the... Uh, the folks up at MIT, when they talk about all the money that they're putting, starting up all these, it's the same thing. They're gonna they're gonna put money into a hundred different businesses. Three of them are gonna make it, mm-hmm. and they're gonna make all their money back and a lot more. Yep. So very that, similar math. Yeah. So so you end up. So what happens at the end of this? So we we got to a point where you know I'd say we were let's call it a year out. Uh, our our focus was we were selling a bit into kind of pro and college sport, and so our uh, use case basically was injury prevention. So we could see if you're a you know wide receiver on a college football team, we could see a hamstring imbalance present before anyone could see it. And then we could help with protocols that would mitigate and reduce injury risk. Great for college and pro sports, but college and pro sports is a shitty business. Mm-hmm. Small markets, very hard and costly to sell into. So it was great from a brand perspective. And then we were doing work with DOD actually. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we looked and said, you know, musculoskeletal injuries and in DOD are catastrophic in number and cost. Most of them are repetitive stress. Uh, they can be mitigated. And so we were doing a bunch of work there. We had some early contracts with the Air Force, with AFSOC, um, down at Lackland's with some really good outcomes, uh, but unfortunately just couldn't get to yeah. uh, kind of cross the chasm and get to big contract. So then when did the CrossFit opportunity present? So I left that, you know, we made the decision, you know, we essentially said, hey, we're gonna wind the company down, look for a buyer. We did that, um, you know, wound it down. And then I spent a little bit of time, um, you know, with family and then had a friend of mine uh, call me and say, hey, you know, I heard CrossFit's looking for a CEO. Do you have any interest? So he had talked to the recruiters. This is probably April of last year, so a little over a year ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and I said, absolutely, I uh, would love to be considered for it. I knew I was a really non-traditional. I had not worked in any sort of, you know, fitness or franchise per se. I had worked in technology, but I'd been in the community for a long time. Um, and so he connected me with the board and uh, the executive recruiters. I went through the process. You know, had this very funny experience of my wife and I had had planned to be off, so we planned a three week trip to Central America, and went through the final stages of the interviews, doing interviews over Zoom from Nicaragua, praying that the power wouldn't go out, um, and that culminated. You know, that wrapped up right before the CrossFit Games last year. When you were studying for the CrossFit CEO role. What was your what did what did it say on your flashcards on your studying flashcards? What were you looking at? What were you trying to understand about the company? So, uh, you know, I wanted to understand a few things. I, I wanted to understand um, just the overall state of the community. So, you know, how was the average affiliate owner feeling? How's the average coach feeling? How's the average member? Is it growing? So, did you reach out to affiliate members and members and coaches at this time? And what were they telling you? I did. So I, you know, I reached out to, so I, I had trained for, when I moved from uh, Pinterest down to Athos, I started training at uh, NorCal CrossFit in Redwood City. So Jason Kalipa's yep. gym, NC Fit now. And so I had met Jason a couple times. And so I sent him a note and said, you know, essentially, would you be willing to share some advice and feedback? Can I pick your brain? So I talked to Jason, uh, talked to a bunch of other folks. Um, I'd gotten to know uh, Dave Castro. So I'd met Dave uh, through another friend. Um, and so I reached out to Dave and, and he was kind enough to kind of share his perspective. 
Uh, and so I wanted to get a sense for, you know, where's the business, where are the state of things, where's the team and where's the culture, where's the state of the community and the ecosystem. And then I wanted to get a little bit of a sense for, I also wanted to understand the, the ownership mm -hmm. and, you know, who these investors were, what, what their priorities were. And then I tried to use that, you know, to, to come in with a point of view on, okay, here's my, albeit with limited context, here's my perspective on, on strengths, weaknesses, opportunities. What does that look like, uh, you know, going into the conversation? Because it was trouble at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, so, so what happened was, let's see, uh, Coach Glassman, who is the founder and I think 100% owner of yep, CrossFit. I think so. He had like tweeted a bunch of, well, I don't know, he tweeted some things. He got, had to step down. Like it was around George Floyd. It was just kind of crazy. Um, he pulled all their social media, like off social media, s stuff like this. And again, I'm, I'm not getting it all, all right because mm -hmm. I, didn't track it that closely, yep. but you know, you'd see this stuff happening. I've had a CrossFit affiliate since 2007 or 2008. So I have to know a little bit about what's going on, yep. but so, so that's happening. You had a bunch of the affiliates were like, oh, CrossFit's gone crazy or whatever, we're out. So you had that happening. There's, I wouldn't say there's, well, there's, there's always been some level of negative press around CrossFit with people getting injured, mm -hmm. with people getting rhabdo, with people being assholes, with people being elitist, like these kind of things. So you you had th those things which I think were, all these things were sort of uh, maybe things to consider <laughs> for you, right? <laughs> Give me a moment of pause. Yeah. yeah, things to consider. And yet, here's the here's the thing that I would, I would assume you latched onto, which is the same reason why I still have a CrossFit affiliate, you have something that is very, very strong at its core. For it sure. unifies people. It definitely, if when when done properly, it turns people that are in terrible shape into great shape. It brings them together. It makes them stronger mentally, physically. It it just has a has had a huge impact, and very much like jujitsu. You ever trained jujitsu? Uh, not serious. Okay. Well. If it wasn't for the Gracie family, like mm -hmm. you can, Gracie has the same, you can say the same thing about the Gracies, yep. right? People can say, oh, you get hurt. People can say, oh, it's cultish. People can say that they didn't uh, evolve their beliefs. Like there's a bunch of negative things you can say about the Gracie family and about the about Gracie Jiu Jitsu. That being said, if it wasn't for Gracie Jiu Jitsu, like, well, first of all, Gracie Jiu Jitsu also is an incredible, like amazing, I know all the, people from the Gracie family, they're all good people. Mm -hmm. So there's that, but also if it wasn't for Gracie Jiu Jitsu, the UFC wouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. And the UFC has now gotten all kinds of people into all kinds of martial arts and there's, that's undeniable. No one yep. can deny that fact. So for me, it's a very similar thing. Yeah. You have some, for lack of a better word, drama around this element, but at the same time, the element itself is so powerful and so good that it just helps a bunch of people. So everyone check, you know, you in California, I mean, in San Diego, you can, there's jujitsu schools on every corner. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and not only that, you can go anywhere in the country now and there's a jujitsu school. People email me from wherever, east, wherever, and they, you know, is there, is there, is there, a, is there a, is there a, a jujitsu school in wherever, Idaho? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Google it, yep, there's one. Yep. So they're everywhere. Yep. So th that's because jujitsu is awesome. Yeah. And I can tell you right now, like people that talk about uh, Olympic weight, weightlifting, guess what brought a, Olympic weightlifting into the limelight for, it's, it's, it's CrossFit, powerlifting, yep. same thing. Gymnastics, same thing. Mm -hmm. These were, these were, and, and look, I've been, do you know what Milo Magazine is? No. Okay, Milo Magazine is like a strongman Olympic lifting magazine. I've been a subscriber to that, it doesn't exist anymore, but I was a subscriber to that since 1994. I was into this stuff, but I'm telling you, right. This stuff has been a niche market uh, around the world. You couldn't go into a freaking gym in 1997 and find an Olympic lifting platform. Mm -hmm. Zero. Mm -hmm. I never went into a gym. Echo Charles, back me up. 
Uh, no, not a public type gym. No, not a public type gym. No. Like not a 24-hour fitness, no. not a normal gym that you could go into and pay a fee. There was no pull-up bars in many cases. Mm-hmm. There might have been one of those like weird like curvy pull-up bars, yeah, yeah. you know, that, I, that I'm against. Yeah, on a universal whatever. Scenario. But there was no squat rack with pull-up bars. Yep. That didn't, there was no dip bar attachment to it. These things didn't exist. There were certainly no rings hanging from the ceiling. So you had this thing that had issues, but damn, if it didn't have, if it hadn't had a major impact and a lot of people had been hugely beneficial. So is that kind of what you were weighing out in your head? For sure. Yeah. And I, you know, I think you frame that really well. And it's funny when I talk to people, you know, people who love CrossFit, they, they would say to me that more than one person saying, that sounds amazing. You should definitely not take that job. It's impossible. <laughs> um, you know, with all of the love for the community, because they saw both sides of the coin for me, you know, I, personally had had you know this uh really life-changing impact you know i was when I, my back was jacked i thought i was done getting after it in the way that i used to mm-hmm. i was 35 being like all right for the rest of my life every morning when i wake up it's going to take me 20 minutes to be able to stand up straight that is just like the price i pay for being dumb when i was in my 20s and so, you know, for me, totally transformative, um, you know, not to mention meeting this amazing community of folks now who I've known for 10 years that I train with every day who are, you know, good friends. And I saw the same thing happen for, you know, hundreds of other people. And so for me, yeah, there was, there were all of those challenges, um, you know, all of the things that I knew was gonna make the job really hard, but I had never seen or experienced anything that had the type of impact on people's lives mm-hmm. that CrossFit does, never. And I, you know, I was lucky to work at companies that have billions of people using their product. Not one of those companies has even close to the type of impact. And the last year for me, just reinforcing it, like my, my wife is kind of sick of like me going home and like, let me tell you another story. I dropped into a random affiliate today. You will not believe this. And so for me, I looked at that and thought, gosh, it's already had a huge impact on so many people's lives. And it's just the tip of the iceberg. Like we we have all of these challenges, but those are also opportunities. If we can, we know it's not as dangerous as people. Mm -hmm. It's not dangerous when done well. Um, We know it's not just for young, super fit people. Mm -hmm. We know if you walk into an affiliate, you're gonna see young, old folks who are fit, folks who are just starting in their journey. If we can just help people understand that and start to shift those perceptions, holy cow, like we can magnify the impact of this thing even more. So when I look at sort of the, 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 the past CrossFit, okay, it seems to me like some of the problems of it were you had uh, Greg Glassman who was, he's like an ultra kind of libertarian type of guy, right? Like, hey, the, 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 the best will rise to the top and if you're not good, you'll just fail. Mm-hmm. So f- it seemed to me, like that attitude, look, I'm I'm pretty much a, I feel that way about most things too. It's like, hey, yep. you work hard and you do a good job, you're gonna excel and you're gonna get credit and things are gonna go well for you. And, but it seemed like, <laughs> so if you were a person that wanted to open a gym and you were a badass person and you cared about your clients and you learned good technique and you maybe had some background in Olympic lifting or you had some background in, in gymnastics or you had some background in some sport that you became a good coach and you would open your affiliate somewhere and you would transform people's lives and they'd invite their friends and all of a sudden they'd have an awesome gym and doing great and making a bunch of money and changing people's lives. And then you got someone else that's like, maybe didn't do any sports, maybe isn't the best person, maybe is not the best coach, and yet they could kind of go through the certification, become a coach, and you know maybe they got a big ego. Mm-hmm. Right, and they want to compete, or they want to yell at people, or, or they want to force people to do things that they shouldn't be doing. And all of a sudden, you have someone get hurt, right? Which certainly, if you do stupid things with heavy weights, you can get hurt. Mm-hmm. And I, from my perspective, because again, it's like the same thing we just talked about. Because CrossFit was so strong, even some of those coaches that shouldn't have been there were still able to bring people in because, Mm -hmm. you know, people saw an article about CrossFit and a person, you know, they went on vacation and someone said, oh, how'd you get in shape? Oh, I do CrossFit. And they go back to their hometown. I want to do CrossFit too. And they roll into this gym and it's not the best coach and they're not getting the right instruction. And so things turn bad. 
So when we talk about like the dangers of CrossFit, which you just which you just said is if you do it right, you'll be okay. Like you can do a clean and jerk with a PVC pipe, and you should when you start doing clean mm-hmm. and jerks. Yeah. So wh- wh- now that now that we're in current days, what are we doing to address these types of issues and sort of standardize and professionalize the force? Yeah. So a uh, bunch there. I think the first thing I'd say is I think it's we have to you know make sure that we recognize i think part of greg's genius early on was understanding that that initial model was essential in attracting the type of entrepreneurial independent small business owners that make crossfit what it is today and so a model in which we say hey look we're going to give you the power to run your own business and exercise your creativity and build something that works for your community i think was really really important uh it also you know without a a model like that we wouldn't have 13,000 gyms today. There's no way. And so I think for us moving forward, we have to be thoughtful about making sure we preserve the the autonomy and the flexibility that allows our affiliate owners to do what they do best. It's what you and I learned in the military. It's decentralized command. Decentralized command. And and so that that is, it is, you know, if you look at a traditional franchise business, you you uh, you exercise quality by control, mm-hmm. by very directive leadership. You will do X, you will do yeah. Y. Here's the 742 page document that's, that's gonna right. explain exactly how everything's set and up. And we're gonna come in and check every single box. Mm-hmm. That that will not work for us. So we have to do you know what we what we learned to do in the military, which is now we have to be really clear about the standard. Okay, what is the standard? And you know, uh, Greg was right, like excellence and virtuosity. That should be our standard. Excellence in coaching, excellence in how we run our affiliates, excellence so that you don't have to think twice. You can walk into any one of our 13,000 affiliates and you're gonna have a great experience. Now that doesn't mean they're all gonna look the same. They won't, they shouldn't. Part of the beauty is there's something unique about every one. But what should be consistent is the quality of the coaching. Um, uh, what should be consistent is how you're supported and treated, the investment in the community, the things that we know really fundamentally matter. So the challenge for us is figuring out how do we think about, you know, we have to clearly articulate what the standard is and we have to figure out how to create the right incentives in the community that allow people that reward the folks who deliver on that. And then in some cases for folks who are not, it's our responsibility. We have to be a custodian HQ. We have to be a custodian for the brand because every, every affiliate owner who is doing their part, who is holding the line is counting on us because we know if you walk into, if somebody walks into an affiliate who's not doing a great job, it doesn't just hurt that affiliate and that individual, it hurts every single other affiliate. And so they gotta hold us accountable. We gotta do a great job of, of holding the overall community of coaches and affiliates accountable for delivering that exceptional experience. And then as part of that, we gotta make sure they have the resources to do it. And so this is, has been a big shift for us. Early on, CrossFit was really a, hey, send us X amount each year, license the brand, it's on you. Over the last year and a half or so, we've invested a lot in a team and in resources that give owners tools and, and, and things that they can use to up-level their coaching, to build a great business, to learn how to support customers through onboarding and uh, all the things that we know to be important. Yeah, it's um, like the restaurant business. If you're gonna open a restaurant or you're gonna open a bar, let's say, you, you got to be personally invested in that bar. You got to be in there and like, hey, what's up, Fred? Yeah, you having your use. You got to, but you got to build that thing. Yeah. And it's that's what that's what like you know at my gym, that's what I realized almost as soon as we opened up. I was like, oh, this is all about these relationships with all these people that are inside this gym. And you can get to a point where the people in the gym have a relationship with each other, and that's awesome too. But yeah, you got to get people that are gonna set things up. So the way they like them, which is the way other people coming into the gym like them, they kind of like really care about it. And just like the best restaurants in the world aren't franchises. It's not It's not like Chili's, right? I mean, nothing against Chili's, because that used to be like kind of the go-to restaurant back <laughs> in the day, but no one, that's not on the list, you know, of top restaurants in the world. Even though it follows a perfect protocol, there's a franchise, they, they, get the, they all get the same food, comes from the same place, yep. you know what you're gonna get. But that's not the best restaurant. It's not. That's not the best restaurant in San Diego. It's not the best restaurant in Chicago. There's chilies in it everywhere, but those aren't, and they're fine. But they're not the best. So if you want to go up a little bit higher, you got to give those people 
the people that are there, the people that own it. You got to give them the autonomy to make things happen with decentralized command. Yeah, couldn't agree more. They've they've got a they've got a feel true ownership. What was it like? when you took over i mean what 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 <laughs> go ahead i was laughing because it, it uh, my first week was the week of the crossfit games so it was insane it was awesome but it was six days of i think i met two thousand people in four days um it was phenomenal um very humbling uh i learned a ton you know and so i i felt i was very lucky even though it was a crazy first week I got six months worth of learning compressed into six days. So what are was, people telling you? Oof, um, you know, I, I think by and large, the top points of feedback were from inside and outside the company. Hey, we love CrossFit. We love this community. We want it to be successful. Um, we need to understand where we're going so we can line around it. Mm -hmm. And so we need clarity of vision. Um, two, we need consistency. You know, the prior X years have been a ton of ups and downs. And for a lot of owners, the changes that we were going through at HQ impacted them. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, we cannot be a liability for them. Mm -hmm. Our job is to support them. And so they ask, hey, look, we need stability. We need confidence in, in where HQ is going, where the brand's going. Um, from the team, I'd say the team was pretty banged up, you know, and I think that the team was candidly probably, you know, let's say maybe cautiously skeptical. Mm -hmm. Hey, we've had a bunch of leadership mm -hmm. changes. Um, you know, we've gone from Greg, this visionary founder who created this thing that has impacted so many people that, that now foundationally is a part of people's identity. You're now the next new guy. There's been a bunch of turnover. Mm -hmm. What's coming? How many weeks are you going to be here for? <laughs> yeah. And oh, by the way, we know this is a job that is really hard to come into and be successful in. And uh, so people were incredibly supportive. People were really candid with me. So I, you know, I walked out of that first week with a lot of excitement, but I, I'd also say, you know, reasonably grounded in the areas where we had a lot of work to do. What, uh, what did you get told that made your fears increase? <laughs> um, we as a, at HQ were, we have, we at that point continue have extraordinary people. Like the rivaling the Marine Corps and people's intrinsic connection to the mission and the cause, just unbelievably selfless, extraordinarily talented people. We were a shitty team. Mm -hmm. um, the company was incredibly siloed. So we have, you know, roughly these, we have our affiliate business. We have a, a business around sport and partnerships. And then we have our education. Those teams didn't really talk to each other, didn't really work together. Um, I'd say we didn't have a a culture internally that was grounded in high trust and clarity. And so, you know, we were not partnering well, we were not showing up, we were speaking to the same customers from different parts of the organization in ways that weren't coordinated. Um, we were stepping on each other. Um, there'd be, uh, you know, well-intentioned mistakes that blossomed into issues because there wasn't a foundation of trust internally that really brought it all together. And what I heard from folks is, hey, that the the higher you get in the organization, the worse it gets. Um, so, and I had spent enough time with the leadership team that knew that we had great people, mm -hmm. but we had some real cultural challenges. And then the positive thing was everyone freaking loved CrossFit. They were everybody was their lives. exactly, exactly. How did you go about crafting? So you hear from these from the team like we don't even know where we're going. Yep. How did you go about? crafting that what does that look like so i spent the first couple months just trying to get out and talk to as many people so i thought about okay i need to spend a lot of time with our team and get to know and hear from them we've got so much collective knowledge and wisdom internally spent a lot of time with owners affiliate owners spend time with coaches uh, and then talk to partners as well and then also you know we have a bunch of folks kind of endemic press within the crossfit ecosystem so anybody who was willing to talk to me i, I tried to just pick folks's brain and then you know i got out on the road so i went to, to south america went to australia wanted to make sure i got the international piece as well um, that for me as i had those conversations uh, you know themes started to emerge okay here are the things that you know people are saying that are great we want to make sure we preserve here's some of the challenges and you know i kind of put that together into we sat down as a leadership team and said okay our our, our job is to serve and support the organization we owe them clarity 
And so uh, that clarity needs to be supported. First, we need a long-term vision. So we are very short-term oriented right now. People don't understand what success looks. And worse, actually, their worst fears are now that Greg has sold the company and we have a new investor, all they care about is money and we're gonna ruin everything that made this special. So we need to communicate a vision to them that they can get excited and, and, uh, and rally around. So we laid that out and we said, okay, on top of that then, that let's call that, it was 2023. So I said, let's round it off to 2030. Let's say a seven, seven year exciting vision. We're gonna do that work. Then we're gonna do a work at three to five year strategy. So that the vision helps us understand what it looks like. Then we need to do the hard work of figuring out how we get there. And then ultimately we're gonna enter by the end of the year, we're gonna have a plan that has a clear set of outcomes and goals for next year that ladder up to our three to five year plan and ladder up to our vision that we can communicate inside the company and we're gonna share outside the, the company as well. Uh, and ultimately that'll be aligned against a set of very objective goals we can measure our progress against. And so where are you at with that right now? So we did that work in the fall. So we started as a team and you know, I, um, you know, the way we approach it, you know, not right or wrong, I, I'll start and write a, you know, I write a, write it down on paper, I'll write a doc. So I think I wrote a, I don't know, five to six, seven page, here's a vision doc and sent it to the leadership team and said, look, most of this is probably wrong or really off, but it's a starting point. So. I'm gonna to try to outline my thinking and the rationale for it. A bunch of my assumptions will be wrong, help me inform it. So we spent a lot of that time as a team, got to a place where the team felt really good about it. We went then and shared it with the company and said, okay, great. And then we shared it externally. So we went to our affiliate owners and in January, uh, right in Pleasanton, uh, up in the Bay Area, went to affiliate owners and said, hey, here's our vision. Here's what we're focused on. Here's what you can expect from us. We're accountable to you. We're gonna be working on your behalf. Um, here's what you can expect from us in the short, medium, and long run. Um, and then, you know, that set up for us, allowed us to enter this year with a set of goals that we said. So we do a, like roughly six months. We'll look and say, hey, you know, by mid-year, we want to be here. We'll take a minute and do effectively an after action. So we'll look and say, okay, what went well? What went wrong? What were the assumptions we had coming in? And then how do we make sure that we learn from those to adjust our strategy? So we just went through that process for the second half of the year. And we communicated that back out to our affiliate owners up in Portland a couple weeks ago. And how's the reception? It's been good. It's been really positive. I think generally, I'd say, um, you know, we've communicated that our, at the end of the day, like what drives everything we do is, is reaching more people and changing more lives through CrossFit. So it's not about revenue. It's not about profit. It's how do we take this thing that is pretty amazing and reach more people with it? And oh, by the way, if we do that, this should be a great business. Mm -hmm. But but for us, um, the financials are not the outcome. And then we talked about, okay, great. What that means is if we're gonna get there, if we're gonna reach more people, we got a bunch of problems we need to solve. So we gotta address this issue around how the brand is perceived, that it's dangerous, that it's intimidating, that it's only for folks who are already fit. Okay, great. We've got a strategy we're going to work and on. And what's there. that strategy look like, just generally speaking? Yeah, so it's it's a mix of I'd say kind of two high level things. One, it's um, doing a bunch of work on the storytelling side to elevate stories that start to shift that perception. So I think the good news for us is we don't have to change CrossFit to come up with something that works for folks who are older. Like we already know it's, it it's works. already been there forever. It's been there forever. All we have to do is elevate the stories that are happening and do a better job with that. So we got some work to do on that front. So a lot of it is just storytelling and this is an area our team has been really good for some time. The other side of it is we got what we're not great at historically is measuring the efficacy of our storytelling. So, okay, great, we just shipped X pieces of content, which of them are working so that we can double down on those that are working and those that aren't. We have a lot of like gut feel. Mm -hmm. So we need to know actually which of those is driving traffic. How is that traffic converting? We we are, should be accountable to our owners around it. So. It's funny how wrong your gut can be. Oh my gosh. And and people will say with a thousand percent yeah. conviction, I right. know this is right. Yeah, watch this video. This thing's going viral. Like, right. no, you got nine views <laughs> and three down votes. <laughs> <laughs> right, but you you get that feeling like oh this this is it this is a great story especially with something like CrossFit which mm -hmm. people are so viscerally connected to oh and yeah so that's one of the areas around our culture that we're trying to shift a little bit the passion is essential but we got to be rigorous we got to validate our assumptions so we're doing better storytelling getting the word out there what else better measurements and then better one of the things we don't do a great job of now is if you get to our website. Um, we do a shitty job of handing you off to an affiliate. So our job should be for folks who are sitting at home, pique their interest in CrossFit, 
get them to CrossFit.com and then hand them to a local affiliate where they can start their journey. And right now the, the experience on the website for us is, is not as tight uh, as it needs to be. So we're working on that. So are you gonna have a map like a geolocator, put your zip code in here? Yeah, so we've had we've had a map for some time. Uh-huh. We're about to come out with in the next couple of weeks an update to the map, which has been overhauled. So it's much better designed. And most importantly, what it'll allow us to start to do is actually measure the number of people that we're handing off to affiliates. So at the end of the day, we need to be able to understand for the amount of cycles that we're spending on telling the story, how many people do we hand off and how many of those people become new members at a CrossFit affiliate and so making sure we've got a really well-designed, you know, we'll call it a marketing funnel that allows us to see exactly how we're doing that work. So we can hold ourselves accountable and we can communicate to affiliates, hey, you're, you're spending money with us every year. We're putting that money to good use. Here's how many people we are sending on your behalf. Yeah. Um, a few years ago at this gym, we all of a sudden we just like our our whatever new inquiries of people walking in and saying hey you know I want to train it just went down a lot and mm-hmm. we spent like two months and my business partner's like yeah I don't know what's going on like we're we're not just not knowing what's happening and sure enough it, we'd somehow fallen off of Google Maps right Google Maps didn't have our gym anymore and all of a sudden like we didn't even know what happened and so that's when we started paying attention to all this kind of stuff. But there's that's that's the way it works, right? I mean, you've got to get you've got to be able to get people to know where to go. That's right. We yeah. I thought about that doing that a long time ago. I should have. We should have. Echo Charles, because people would always say, "Where should I train jujitsu? Where should I train jujitsu?" And it it doesn't matter as much anymore. That's why I haven't made an effort to do it anymore. Because now jujitsu is so popular, and there's so many people, and people that aren't good coaches, they don't survive. They the internet will eat them alive. Like you can't be a fake jujitsu black belt and be teaching because you'll just get annihilated. Mm -hmm. So, but for a while, maybe like five years ago, I was thinking we should do sort of like a, you know, Jocko approved, Mm -hmm. this is an approved, jujitsu approved place to train and have a map and you put in your zip code and there you go. These, These are some cool instructors, here's the vibe there. And, cause it's so important, people get that interest, they do the Google search and yet, the next step, that's a big next step. You know, I sell stuff online. That's a smaller step to click. Totally. Cart or whatever. Yep. But you're losing people at each stage. Yep, yep. Yeah, and we we haven't, you know, for the past at least few years, haven't been doing a lot of the, the basic blocking and tackling. Mm-hmm. So uh, you search for CrossFit mm-hmm. on Google, and our competitors have the first row of yeah, p- yeah. paid ads. Yep. And that's a, not an untraditional yep. thing, but we weren't even playing there. Yeah. So we weren't even making it hard for them. So there's a lot, a lot of stuff that we're doing now there that'll have a big impact. Yeah, that's like when people have the actual name Jocko. <laughs> They'll buy my name on Amazon or on Google, and we, we're pretty good about it now. We've we've made it cost them a lot of money if they want to play that game. Yep. But uh, you know, it's pretty insane that that's what goes down. Yeah, that you can you can bid on those keywords on somebody else's trademark. It sucks. Yeah. Yep. That's how these. That's how year old stomping grounds make money, right? <laughs> That's right. We you can hold be, me accountable. We, Trust yeah. me, I was very far from any important decisions like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so then what does it look like? Uh, so we got the um, the CrossFit Games coming up. Yeah. What, in a week? Yes, yeah, starts next week. Are you going? Yeah. Because I'm going. For sure, it's sweet. <laughs> I, I, unfortunately, I didn't get it scheduled early enough, so I'm there for like a day. But okay. We got the bunch of people coming up from Jocko Fuel to check it out. I have only watched CrossFit Games on TV. How hype is it live? It's amazing. It's super awesome. I uh, last year was my first games, um, which I immediately regretted not having gone before. The watching the competition is amazing, but just being in in and around the community. So CrossFit, like I. I but, Huge part of CrossFit's magic in my mind is our community. Mm. It's just so, it's super special. And part of that for most folks, the community they experience is in their own affiliate. And that's awesome Mm. and amazing. But there's also this other community of millions of people. And when you go to an event like the games, I remember walking around last year, probably day three for me, and thinking to myself, there are a few places, right? You could draw a ring around the games right now, this event. And there are probably not another 15,000 human beings who are happier, healthier, fitter, more resilient on the planet anywhere. And you walk around and you see people, the, the level of happiness and excitement and 
standing in stark contrast to what you see, sadly, in most of our society. But that really struck me. So it's just a super fun, high energy, positive environment. We've got a really, we've done a lot of work to, to build out experiences for the fans. So we'll have uh, throwdown training sessions where we effectively allow fans to do similar workouts to what the elite athletes are doing under conditions that feels like you're getting after it. I did one in Berlin. You have an announcer, you have a DJ, you're doing the same. I mean, it is, that is as close as I'll ever get to anything quasi elite, but it's super fun. And then we do a bunch of work for our affiliate owners as well. Yeah, that's a, a good point when you get around, like I go to jujitsu events and you get that same thing because everyone there is, is 99% of the people there are training and they're in good shape and they're working hard. And just like, you know, the Marine Corps said what I opened with and just like I wrote about in, in Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual and just actually one of the most key things that Echo Charles ever said on this podcast was there's nothing that, there's nothing that you can do in life that's gonna positively impact more other things in your life than exercise. Mm -hmm. Like if you're a person and you don't work out, you know, that was another thing I was considering reading on this was there's a, the opening of the book, Starting Strength. And in the opening of the book, Starting Strength, he basically says like, hey, I understand that people are out there doing their jobs and maybe you're an accountant and maybe you're doing a good job with that, but, and, and no one would say that this guy's unhappy because he's an accountant but wouldn't he be more happy if he had a 405 <laughs> squat? <laughs> Always. <laughs> it's like, yes, you will be happier. You'll be a happier human. So that's a, that's a good way to go. Um, what else, man? Does that get us up to date? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Next week? Next week. We'll, we'll be, be good up to there. have you there. Yeah. Um, we have a partnership with Jocko Fuel and CrossFit, which has been freaking awesome. Amazing. Awesome to launch. Again, we I go to events. You know, I just did a couple live events. And, we did Detroit, we did Chicago, we did Boston, and we did Philly. And it's the same thing, like people are in the game, people are trying to get better. And you can just see the attitudes of the people there. We always have to warn our, like when we do events at Echelon Front, we do events, we'll tell the hotel, like hey, just so you know, we're opening the doors at eight, people will be outside you know, an hour and a half earlier. And we're doing a PT at, f at 4.30 in the morning or 4.45 in the morning. They're like, what are you talking about? There, there, is anyone going to go with you? We will say, yeah, 900 people are going to be out there. <laughs> and they don't understand it because yeah. it's a different group of people. Mm -hmm. And again, when you have people that are focused, when you have people that are, that are exercising and b being able to exercise with other people and being in a friendly yet competitive environment and pushing each other and pushing themselves... It's a win. 100%. People are showing up <laughs> that early excited to do really hard shit. Yeah. And walk out the other end of it just buzzed. Yeah. Buzzing. And you've got to remember how good that's going to make you feel when you get done. Because prior to and during, sometimes don't feel too good, right? <laughs> sometimes the squats get a little bit painful. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> uh, so for where can we find, where can we find you? Right, you're on Twitter. I'm on Twitter, um, and despite having worked in social media, I, uh, to my wife's great chagrin, I think I have 12 Instagram posts since your, 2012. Your your game is weak. I my game is out, extremely. I checked weak. out your Twitter. I checked out your Instagram. I checked out your Facebook. For a guy that worked at Google and Facebook and Pin, maybe are you hiding on Pinterest, mommy? <laughs> maybe is that where, you're, you're not going to find me though. There? I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> um, but you're there. But I guess if people really want to know what's going on with what we're talking about, it's it's at CrossFit. That's it's, right. Uh, CrossFit.com. CrossFit it's at CrossFit. It. They're on all social media platforms. They got the YouTube channel. Apparently, the website's being improved as we speak. That's right. Things are moving in the right direction, and um, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. Echo Charles. Yes. What do you got? You got any questions? Uh, yeah, kind of light, light questions. Um, so I've been to a few CrossFit gyms, and but all the times that I've went, with the exception of this one here, um, it, there was like an actual like class going on. Yep. Can you just roll in and do your own workout or like how did, so, what's the tradition? So the tr for most folks who are getting started with CrossFit, the traditional thing is just show up. If you've not done CrossFit before, 
Um, each gym's a little bit different, but a lot of gyms will have kind of an onboarding class or session. Sometimes it's one on one. And if you're not familiar with Olympic lifting, for example, um, the coach will walk you through kind of the fundamentals. You know, everything comes down to, down to you know, CrossFit, making sure you get the mechanics right, yeah. getting them consistent before you introduce any sort of load or intensity. Mm-hmm. And so there's usually an onboarding class. That'll then graduate to, and again, it depends on the gym, but graduate into folks jumping right into sessions. And again, the beauty of CrossFit is you could be doing a class, it could be your third day where you're super unfamiliar and you could be training some next to someone who's going to the CrossFit games in their age group. Mm-hmm. And the nature of how that class is run and how it's scaled makes it, it possible for folks to train together in a way that feels really comfortable, motivating, et cetera. Um, most gyms also have open gym time. So okay. for a lot of folks, yeah. if they want to do accessory work or some additional, that you can schedule yeah. that as well. If I go in a CrossFit gym on open open, open mat gym. time, mm-hmm. open gym, and I do curls in the squat rack, well, bonus can I, points. Can I still come? Oh, okay, okay. I, that's uh, cool. Uh, that's bicep violation. curls are universally praised in uh, okay. every sport <laughs> methodology. So. <laughs> All right. So I'll still be allowed back the for next sure. day. Okay. You got to do All you right. got to do the CrossFit workout as well. But. Oh, okay. All right. I Let's would encourage. I've been to CrossFit gyms where they have open gym. I I'm so happy when they have open gym. I would encourage if you have a CrossFit gym to have open gym as much possible time as you can. Uh, and I think that's very helpful. There are some gyms. Usually, it's when they're really small. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't they don't have any open gym, but. I would encourage you to have open gym. I think it's healthy. I think it's healthy to be getting in there. And, you know, it's not, not gonna get to train too much, right? Not gonna get to well, train too much. I think what you much. find too with open gym is I think one of the cool things about CrossFit is you've got this constant journey of getting better. Mm. And there's so much compl- you know, potential complexity and advancement in everything you do. So you're gonna find games athletes who are still working on, at the very highest level, who are still working on some of their gymnastics movements. And when you get started, so for me, I've been doing it nine years now. I do open gym because there's a few weaknesses I want to work on. And so you're constantly thinking about, okay, like my ring muscle ups suck. Mm -hmm. I am not good at them. I'm going to get some extra time uh, so I can start to work on it. And you start to develop that attitude within it where it's constant progression and evolution. Yeah. Uh, Anything else? Echo Charles. That's it. You know, I would say over the years, I have gotten echo charles to start doing metabolic conditioning right. do i get credit for the metcons you do yeah. i do get credit for the what's metcons. your f- favorite workout no. or least favorite My metcon? Li- well yeah what well, is a metcon an actual workout like a it's wad? any type it's yeah like a like a wad metabolic conditioning so yeah. variety of different stuff high heart rate yeah yeah so just well, circuit training so yeah, kettlebells look. actually my favorite one are you asking me what my favorite one yeah. is okay so it's a circuit of kettlebells if there's bicep curls in here it's getting disqualified no yeah <laughs> no i do the bicep curls before so <laughs> no worries we're good to go uh kettlebells clean and jerk is it yeah be one hand, be each hand um so i go from that to burpees to jumping jacks mountain climbers all right legit yep and Sweet. then how many how many rounds do you do with that? As many as I can for whatever. Sometimes it's like twenty five minutes. Sometimes twenty five like, minutes of that, huh? Yeah, that's you, aggressive. That's, that's yeah. we don't even we're not a hundred percent sure if that's a metcon anymore. Ah, it's pretty, <laughs> yeah, it might just turn into like yeah. you know. But it goes as low as six minutes too. Mm-hmm. So what's worse? What's harder? What six minutes or twenty five? Twenty five. Mm-hmm. Five. Like twenty five. So you, is... you say that to me like I'm an idiot, right? Yes. But here's I the do. thing. <laughs> Here's the thing, right? For me, there's days where six minutes is going to be heinous, but 25 is going to be okay because I'm like going to be able to like you're going to you're going to have to back off a little bit, yeah, right? I, and then there's days where 25 minutes is going to be heinous, and yeah. six minutes is going to be I'll, I'll get some. Well, okay, so and I get it, I understand fully. I I get the um the six minutes, even if it's super hard. Mm-hmm. Usually, it's like 10, under 10, like. Eight, mm-hmm. eight and a half. Yeah, that's usually mm-hmm. where it kind of sorts itself out because it's a perfect, in my opinion, the perfect balance of like actual the strength part of it. Mm-hmm. You know, the twenty five minutes. That's like I'm using lightweight. It's kind of like a more of a cardio that's what thing. I'm saying. That's yeah, right. but I get super bored with that. So once you reach like the fifteen minute mark, I'm like, bro, this just sucks. This is not even fun anymore. The six minutes is like, sure, it gets su- it can yeah. get super hard, but at least it's kind of exciting in there. At least you got to get yourself fired up. You know, yeah. I'd way rather endure that than the boredom part of it. Mm. What do you think? 
Uh, the really short workouts were worse for me. Mm-hmm. Like doing a Fram, which is like a three to four minute, God. just like your lungs hurt for, you know, you're rolling on the floor. Those yeah. are the worst workouts for me. Yeah. Oh, the, dang. Those okay. are no, those are horrible and mm-hmm. glorious. At the same time. Yeah. They're more exciting though, right? They are. are. Don't you get like more fired up for that? For I feel sure. like yeah. that. Like, I agree with you on the invoke. boredom piece. It's yeah, a yeah. different type of grind. Yeah, yeah. It is weird how emotionally, and I'm going to say that word. Yes, sir. Emotionally, Passionate. for a like a four minute Fran, emotionally, the first minute and a half is actually just no factor, and you're kind of like, oh, I'm I'm a badass, yeah. Yeah. and then you get hit in the face with a baseball bat, <laughs> and you're like, I want to die. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, That's and a, you know you can do more, and they hurt so bad. Uh, yeah. yeah. Did it's you gotcha. run track before? By chance, I did. My wife did. Yeah, so there's a there's the a race the 400 meter, mm. and they would say that that's like the worst one, yeah, because it's right in the mm. zone. I thought they said the 800 meter is the worst one. Well, in I don't know, and maybe in uh, when you get a higher level for sure, mm. but in high school, it's 800 oh, okay. is kind of more of a distance yeah. kind of scenario. I'm sure it would suck, but because the 400, once you get past 200 meter, you're just like holding on. You for leave dear your life. body. Yeah, it's like harsh, man. Yeah, I think the professionals, it becomes 800 meters because yeah, they yeah. become so conditioned. Yeah, but I for them, right. they get to the 400 meter and they got another 400 to go. And it's a <laughs> complete freaking utter nightmare. Yeah. yeah. yeah so yeah. Well, you don't want none of that, no. apparently. No. Uh, Don, you got any closing thoughts? Just thank you, guys. Really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, well... Thanks for coming down, and I'm sure we'll be seeing more of you in the future, and I look forward to seeing you out at the games. That'll be fun, and um, thanks for coming out. Thanks for sharing your experiences. I mean, that's a a pretty wild ride you've been on so far, and I know you're just getting warmed up, and thanks for sharing your lessons learned, and of course, thanks for your service in the Marine Corps. You know, um, can't ever underestimate when people step up and serve their country, so thanks for doing that. Likewise. And of course... uh, Thanks for doing what you're do to, doing today to help people get stronger, faster, and healthier. Love it. Appreciate Thank you, it, guys. Man. Appreciate it. And with that, Don Fall has left the building. So, looks like we're working out. Looks yes. like we're doing Metcons. Yep. Looks like we're getting stronger. Looks like we're pushing each other. Looks like we're rolling into the box, the CrossFit, getting after it. And that means you're going to need some fuel. Yep. Some fuel for that evolution. <laughs> uh, good place to get fuel, the right fuel, the clean fuel, Jocko Fuel. JockoFuel.com. Get some milk, which is protein. Mm-hmm. They're, ma- they're a little bit mad at me. Who? Uh, everyone at Jocko Fuel. Okay. Especially Joe Moss. That makes sense. Well, I'll tell you why. Because I called the protein mulk right which is its own word its own name and people don't know what it is yeah initially so unfortunately for the team they have to explain it a thousand times yeah okay they go do you guys want mulk in your store and they go what's mulk and they say it's protein they say yes yeah that took them an extra three seconds can be can be a pain, right? Yeah, After yeah. your seventeenth thousandth time. Yeah. But for you out there, you you should know what milk is. If you don't, it's protein, clean protein, tasty protein, dessert protein. You can get it in powder form, pow pow, or you can get it, sure. or you can get it in ready to drink form. Whichever form you get it in. It will take out, take you out of your catabolic state where your your body is destroying itself, mm-hmm. and will start to build and rebuild. So you can get some of that. So it works. Hey, here's a here's a tip. Mm-hmm. Not a tip, like it's a tip. But what you do is you call it milk protein. Yeah, that's what we try and do now. Yeah, yeah. milk protein. Because actually, they have a point. If you're if if I we're know. just saying milk, and you know how you just kind of implied, oh, it takes three seconds or whatever, yeah. which I dig, I yeah. dig no, it. No, so I, on the surface, this is a viable. This is I I I. What's the word? I downplayed it, but yeah. it's a legitimate thing. So you're yeah. correct. So go ahead. Yeah, because you know how you, when you um when you inundate someone's brain with decisions, mm-hmm. right? They start to get um like diminish. What do you call it? like the 
their decision making like people don't want to make a bunch of decisions that's right. why if you have a menu with like a million items it's like you, you risk selling nothing kind of a thing but it, so if you're like hey you want some milk it's like frick I, I, let me think I don't know do I don't I I don't even know what that means now you just you're giving them uh, decision fatigue mm-hmm. just from from that one little unnecessary time yep. see what I'm saying and and especially if you're in a sales situation yep. there's a, what's it called sales resistance or sales the thing where you know someone's selling you something so you automatically have your defense up it's called something i think mm-hmm. it's like sales resistance or whatever okay so if you're like hey you want some milk in your thing the sales resistance is up because i don't even know what that is stop trying to sell me something i don't need you know the resistance is is going to be way more up but if you say hey you want some milk protein or you want some protein powder it's like hmm, wait we we might you see what i'm saying the resistance yep. is not as, as much this up. is this is why I, th- this is my fault obviously you yes, know sir. and yeah. here was my little rationalization when this happened. What, the three-second thing? No, when I made up the name Mulk. Oh, got it. For me, Mulk, it tasted so good, and it was so good for you. To me, it was a different thing. (laughs) Like, protein shakes taste bad. Milkshakes aren't good for you. We had something new. It tastes good, and it was good for you. It's something new. We need a new name for it. And in my mind, I was this is going to be like a Xerox machine. Like, you know how people say, hey, can you make me a Xerox of this? (laughs) Yeah. People needed something, a different name for it. Yeah. Because it was so different. Or like people say, oh, can you pass me a Kleenex? Mm -hmm. That's the name brand. I thought the world, all over the world, people would be like, hey, I need a milk. Not a protein shake, because they didn't want that. And not a milkshake, because they don't want that. They're gonna be like, oh, I need a milk. Just what we call it now. Yeah. So in my little infantile brain, that's what I thought would happen. What I should have done something similar is energy drinks. Because our energy drink is truly good for you. Truly good for you. And yet when people think energy drinks, they think bad for you. They think yes. chemicals, they think high caffeine, they think sugar. Yeah. And we don't have sugar, we don't have chemicals, and we have a good, serviceable, good for you level of caffeine. Yeah. So it's a good thing. But we didn't make up a word for the energy drinks. Mm. Well, maybe I should have. Maybe you still can. Okay, so we have, you know what, uh, apparently in the streets, Hell yeah. from the field, yeah. uh, in in Philly, coming back from Jocko Live, they call it Jocko. It's called, they call it one word, like Jocko. Oh yeah, oh yeah, got the Jocko drink. Yeah, yeah. So it's like Jocko, but they say go kind of, Jocko. Jocko. Like, Jocko. like, oh, you got that Jocko drink. They say it in one word. Jocko. So there's yeah. the okay. people. Has legs, the streets, I think. that's what they're calling it, yeah, right? Yeah. So maybe I made a mistake with the milk. Maybe I made a mistake by not coming up with something better for the energy drink. But these are the mistakes that I've made. I apologize. We'll, we appreciate you working with us to take what's good for you. Yep. You know, uh, we got joint health stuff, joint warfare. We got super krill oil. We got, you know, Immunity, Cold War. Cold Wars. If you're on the road, take Cold War. Yep. It's like 100 percent good to go. Yeah. You don't. You go and shake a bunch. You sit in an airplane, shake a bunch of hands. Like what you're doing, you're getting your disease. <laughs> you gotta fend <laughs> well, it off. Well, uh, yeah. So, JockoFuel.com. Check it out. We got everything that you need on there. You can get it at Wawa. Slim pickings at Wawa yeah. due to the. The, the beverage empires that are out there trying to shut down the rebels. Mm. They're buying all the slots. That's what's happening. We're hanging in there. Yeah. But in the meantime, Vitamin Shop, GNC, Military commerce, Commissaries, AFES, Hannaford's. Hannaford's going hot. Dash Stores, Wakefern, ShopRite, HEB. HEB in Texas. Hey, thank you, HEB, and thank you, State of Texas Troopers. Folks that are out there in the game, just going in, we're, we're crushing an HEB. So thank you. Same thing with Meyer up in the Midwest. Harris Teeter, we got Lifetime Fitness, Shields. And look, CrossFit, we're talking about CrossFit today. If you wanna sell this product in your gym, email jfsales at jockofuel.com and we can get it in there for you. Get you Maybe get you a little refrigerator. You can just have it ready to go. Same thing, you got a little jujitsu academy? Mm. You got that academy? You want to sell some good stuff? You want to help your clients, help your students, and you help yourself because you know it's going to another little bit of an income stream, right? 
So let's get let's make it happen. There you go. That's what we're doing. Jockofuel.com. Yep. Also, Origin USA. These are. This is where you can get your okay, RTX run, train, everything else. Execute is. Execute. I think I say execute. I think maybe Pete says it's like an X, like yeah, a variable. Yeah, like, like a variable, yeah. Mm-hmm. Hell yeah. Yeah, I like that one. I guess execute is cool too, but isn't, isn't execute an E? Yeah. But an X is like trend. It's like hip. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Either way, it's Look athletic it. gear. Yeah, it is. But yeah, cool. Athletic gear, good. That is very good. But it's all made in America, mm-hmm. which is even better. It's like adds the additional. <sighs> but also, they got some jujitsu stuff on there. Geese and rash guards. Some jujitsu stuff. Yeah. They got all jujitsu stuff. Yes. What else the, do you need from jujitsu? That you can't buy at Origin. You get the uh, gi. You yeah. get the rash guard. I you got the right. shorts. Yep. That's right. You're ready to go. Yeah. I just meant it as there's some jujitsu. You go to originusa.com. Mm. You can get the RTX stuff. The you get the jujitsu stuff the specifically move. for jujitsu. Then you also got the jeans, the boots. You see what I'm saying? So I say some jujitsu. That's just mm-hmm. part of what Origin offers is what I'm saying. What I'm implying. I don't, know. I don't know why my son asked me this the other day, but he said, how many times have you worked out in pants, in sweatpants in your life? Yeah. Oh, no, he said, when's the last time you worked out with sweatpants? That's right. what it was. Yeah. I said, I don't think I've worked out with sweatpants in, in, in at least a decade. Mm. And I don't think I've ever worn pants, sweatpants while working out three times in my entire life. Damn. All right. Yeah. That's my crazy. legs don't get cold. Huh. But if your legs get cold, which maybe your legs a little bit more <laughs> <laughs> aerodynamic. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, little, you know what I mean? Like uh, that a little yeah, bit. I know what you mean. You Thank know, you. Some people think you have skinny knees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I Maybe think. they get cold. Okay. You yeah, get some yeah. joggers. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing. If it's cold, well, it's not necessarily, oh, my legs feel cold. It's not uh-huh. that. It's for okay. like, hey, when you're warming up, like, okay, you ever worked out in a sweater? Or not a sweater, like a hoodie or something yeah, like yeah, this? Yeah. You have? Most of, yeah. Yeah, why? Because... Keep my upper body, get my upper body warmed up. Warmed up for that workout. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Same deal. Okay. Right, you're doing some squats, mm-hmm. some deep squats. Check. It's better to be warm than not warm. I'll tell you that. Better Check. to be loose than not loose than stiff. Concur. Saying, Maybe just- I need to give a shot. That's the justification on that one. <sighs> so there you go. Go to originusa.com. Get some American made quality. Make it happen. Make it happen. Also, JockoStore.com. This is where you can get your Discipline Equals Freedom shirts, hats, some hoodies on there, some accessories on there. You want a flag? You want a flag? Mm-hmm. Fly the flag of discipline? We got one on there. The DEFCOR flag. DEFCOR flag. X flag even. That's when you're going deep right mm-hmm. there. The X flag. It's actually, a lot of people have that one. It's a good one. Um, also, there's the Shirt Locker, which is a new shirt. Everywhere. A lot of representatives of the Shirt Locker at Jocko Live this yeah. past yeah. weekend. I saw a comment. Mm-hmm. In, it said, oh, I don't see many shirt locker shirts because I posted a picture or something. Mm. I don't know what w- moment I caught, but there was there was shirt locker shirts in a big way. Oh, it was pretty right. awesome. Oh, yeah. yes. Sir. I would go so far as to say 40% of the people at these gigs were representing while on the path. That's what it felt like. I would have guessed 40%. Too. Right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. That might be a little bit high, but not too high. No, it was, well, the people I saw, I mean, granted, I didn't look at what everyone was wearing, but yep. the, the frequency in yeah. which, boom, was uh, it was hitting me, Yeah, I think 40 Pretty awesome. Yeah, very good. But if you don't know what this is, it's a new shirt. It's a new shirt every month. Mm-hmm. Different designs that represent the path in various ways. One of them, which a guy was wearing, by the way, I got like literally scolded for. For what? For one of the designs. Oh, yeah, yeah. The don't F it up one. Yeah. But it just said don't F with a flag. There was a K, so I guess yeah. there's an implied <laughs> swear word there. Uh, it up. Yeah. Pretty big. But kind of muted, though. It's not all bold or whatever. It's kind of muted a little bit. But nonetheless, that's just one. That, that was the most controversial one I'm so not far. 100% sure if that shirt would have passed my scrutiny. Yeah. Well, But I think it probably would have. You think so? You know? Because occasionally... You got to go outside the box just a little bit. Yeah. Well, to me, when the, the reason that it probably wouldn't have so the first complaint I got, I was like, oh, f- 
I think he's right. Mm -hmm. You know, like I was always sketch about the whole swearing, wearing shirts with swearing on it. Yeah. But then again, bro, there's more people than me, just me. You know, there's a lot. There's some of them that I'm like, bro, this one is going to land. Bro, everyone's going to love. This is the best one. This is the best one. And then people won't like it. Mm -hmm. And then there's ones that I'm like, okay, this one's cool, but, you know. People really dig it. Yeah, exactly right. So you just never know. Everybody's different. And that's kind of part of the reason for this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas you get a wide variety of cool stuff. In my opinion, hey, hey look, you're going to find something cool. See what I'm saying? Even if you don't think every single one is cool, a cool one's going to come in and yeah. you'll be excited about that one. Well, there you go. So anyway, jockostore.com, that's where you can check them out. Hey, also check out primalbeef.com. Primalbeef.com. We got Sean Glass, veteran, former SEAL officer, and he has got a little little beef thing going out there. They got ribeyes on there? They got ribeyes. Primalbeef.com, and it's one of these things where you can order like a an assortment of meat. Yeah. They got a bunch of different ways. They got a kick-ass packaging thing set up. I already got my first box. And this meat is good. GTG. You know what that means? Yes, I do. Yeah. Of course. This meat is a cut above GTG. For real. It's freaking good to go. So go on there. You want to support veterans? You want to support like good farming? Go ahead and check it out. Primalbeef.com. Get yourself some steak. Get yourself some burgers. Get yourself some some beef hot dogs. Yep. That's what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> also. Uh, subscribe to the podcast because we're here. We used to argue about whether it was worth saying that yeah. for about probably 90 episodes. Yeah. I'd say, why are we still saying this? Yeah. And yet I just said it. And now it's been 397 episodes. So anyway, yeah. subscribe to the podcast if you haven't yet. And also subscribe to Jocko Underground. We just got done recording a new Jocko Underground talking about compromise. We talk about all kinds of subjects on there. We also answer a bunch of questions. Subscribe to that, jockounderground.com. Also, YouTube channel, also Psychological Warfare, also flipsidecanvas.com. Dakota Meyer making cool stuff for you to hang on your wall. We got a bunch of books. We got, you know what I haven't talked about? The ABCs of Jiu-Jitsu hmm. by, by Coach Adam Mazin. The same Coach Adam from Way of the Warrior Kid. Is that yeah. the same Adam? Coach yeah. Adam? Yeah, Coach Adam. He's and same. Chris Ehlers who's another jiu-jitsu guy, did all the artwork. He's a tattoo artist, but he's also a sick, just artist artist. He did the artwork in there. And where would you, where does this book land? It's it's like not quite a kid's book, but it is a kid's book. Mm. It's not quite an adult book, but it is an adult book. Yep. It's just like, it's for everyone, I guess. And if you, this is actually one of the things I noticed when I was kind of going all through it, like halfway, I'm like, wait a second, is this a coloring book too? Mm. And you know what he said? It can be. It can be. Yeah. The thing is the art, alone is it's the kind of art you could just hang on the wall yeah in fact we should maybe we should offer some prints yeah anyways um check it out abcs of jiu-jitsu also i wrote a bunch of books too you can check those out final spin leadership strategy and tactics field manual code evaluation protocols discipline equal freedom manual field manual way the warrior kid let's get those for every kid that you know Mikey in the draft. I signed so many Way of the Warrior Kid books. Yeah. And little warrior kids were coming out to the live events. Yep. And I'm talking about some heavy stuff in those things. I'm talking about life, yep. death, disease, trauma. And these kids are there in the front row, big eyes, taking notes. What's yep. up? Warrior kids. So check all that out. Plus we got Hackworth, signed a bunch of Hackworth, bunch of about face, obviously. Extreme ownership, dichotomy of leadership. Check out all those books. And speaking of dichotomy of leadership and extreme ownership, we have a leadership consultancy. We solve problems through leadership. Go to echelonfront.com. We sold out the Dallas gig, the Dallas muster. There's still a few slots left for FTX, individual FTX down in Texas that JP's running. Go and, get, go and engage in combat situations, simulated combat situations, and learn how to lead. Check that out. We got the Women's Assembly coming up which is September 14th through the 16th in Phoenix, Arizona. Jamie Cochran was getting pictures taken with people. They know who she is. They understand that she understands. So go check that out. You can find all of this stuff, and plus you can find out about our consulting services at echelonfront.com. We also have an online academy, so you can learn about leadership while you're sitting in the comfort of your home. You don't have to pay some crazy amount of money to travel. 
You don't have to bring in Echelon Front to your organization. You can just go to extremeownership.com and you can take courses. You can ask questions on live sessions. We've got all kinds of incredible ways to teach you the skills of leadership that you can apply. You can apply with your boss. You can apply with your peers. You can apply with your subordinates. You can apply with your husband. You can apply with your wife. You can apply with your kids. You will learn how to lead and it will make every aspect of your life better. Extremeownership.com. And if you want to help service members active and retired, you want to help their families, you want to help Gold Star families, check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got an incredible charity organization. If you want to donate or you want to get involved, go to americasmightywarriors.org. Also, you got Micah Fink. He's got heroesandhorses.org. He just got a group out of the field. They spent 41 days in the field getting reconnected with their soul. It's an awesome program. And if you want to connect with us on the interwebs, of course, we got CrossFit.com. If you want to check out this whole CrossFit thing that we talked about today, all kinds of positive things will come out of your life if you start to get in better shape, if you start to connect with other people that are in good shape, if you start to exercise and have a routine. This is all positive. It's all going to help you in every aspect of your life. And that's a quote from Echo Charles. So check out CrossFit.com and go check out the you know social media cham- channels at CrossFit and as well as Don, who is terrible. Despite working at Facebook, despite working at Pinterest, despite working at Google, he's got nine Instagram posts. So go has- hassle him at Don Fall. It's D-O-N-F-A-U-L. And Echo's there as well. He's at Echo Charles. I am at Jocko Willink. And all I'm going to say is, look, you can be in good physical shape. You can know jujitsu. But you can get caught up by that algorithm. I know Echo Charles the other day. He was in the hotel. He was in the lobby. I came out. I looked at him. I saw him. He's wrapped in the algorithm. The algorithm had him by the throat. No, had him didn't. by the neck. No, it didn't. Bro. Oh, it's playing were, chess. You on were chess. wrapped up com. in the algorithm. No. All right. Well, I mean, hey, man, if you say so, but hey, I deliberately su- seeked, sucked, seeked? Sought. Sought out a specific app. Okay. So. For those of you that don't know, and apparently we all need to know this, <laughs> Echo's going down the, the he's, on, he's in the chess game right now. He's been playing chess. He's on chess.com. What's your call sign? Your Echo Charles 24. So if you want to challenge Echo Charles 24 to yep. a chess match, he's on their chess.com. Yep. He is looking to gain experience. He's learned a few lessons so far. He's learned about cover and move. Yep. He's learned about decentralized command. These things are all applicable. Yeah. They're yep. all applicable. Yeah, I'd say more so than I'm looking for. What'd you say I was looking challenge for? Challenge matches? Cha- yeah, I'm looking for challenge matches for sure. Mm-hmm. I'm not looking for uh, experience. I'm looking for the experience of the challenge match, grudge match. Do you put money on these games? No. I don't. Okay. So <laughs> there it is. You can find us. It, you and go. it's better that you play chess than you are scrolling through the gram it's true bro it was weird because you know how like you you stumble onto something you're like oh yeah you're kind of into it or whatever Mm. and you don't realize where bro i wasn't on instagram for like two days not at all not one single Mm. time for two days but i was on i was on the chess.com for probably more than i should have been but Mm. but still it's better than instagram yeah it is and you got challenge matches going with your son right is that what's happening yeah with my son i just put main tie on there and Mm. and liam on there bro don't put those guys on there they got work to do i don't they need to I be guess. editing videos. Yeah, that, that's true. So that's going to be on them. You know, they're going to exercise discipline. Yeah. See what I'm saying? All right. Well, there we're at. Watch out for the algorithm. Go to chess.com, I guess, is what <laughs> what we're doing. Echo Charles 24 challenge matches. Let's go. And uh, thanks once again to Don for coming on and for his service. And thanks to all our service men and women out there who are staying fit. Stay fit. If you're in the military, please get after it. That way you are better prepared to protect us and our freedoms. Also, thanks to our police, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, Border Patrol, Secret Service, all first responders, same message for you. Be in shape. Be fit. Usually they have good deals to go to CrossFit and your law enforcement, your police, jiu-jitsu gym, same things. They People take care of you. In, in these communities. So go and check it out so you can do your job better 
and protect us, which we thank you for. And to everyone else out there, you got to prioritize your health. That's what you got to do. You have to do everything that you possibly can to maintain your health. And, and it is a struggle. It's an uphill battle. And the slope is slippery. And listen, you know what? I understand that there are things, there absolutely are things that we cannot control. There's wretched diseases that we cannot control. There are accidents that happen that are beyond our control. Sometimes we just have bad luck. But remember that there is so much we can control. So much that we can control. Namely, what we eat and how we exercise. And these are the two biggest things that impact our health. So don't take your health for granted. Make it, truly make it your number one priority every day. And, and look, if you go through a spell where you got something going on and you gotta, you gotta refocus for a little while, a couple months goes by, look, I get it. We all go through times like that. We got a sick kid. We got a project that's going on. We got things that happen that are beyond our control. But listen, don't let that become the norm. Get back on the path. And you do that by going out there every day and getting after it. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko out.